everybody. Welcome back to the Den of Sin with Devin and James. I'm here with my co-host James. How you doing, James? I'm doing all right, Devin. Happy to uh, happy to see you over Zoom virtually. <laughs> we'll be in the same room again eventually. It's just you know I I always hear when I'm listening to other podcasts. You know I hear all these people lamenting. Uh, oh well, when we're in the same room again, and now that things are starting to clear up, I'm actually starting to hear some of my favorite podcasts go back to recording in the same room again. And they're so happy about it. And I just keep on thinking, oh, if if only geography weren't keeping us apart. This was never a pandemic decision. <laughs> this will always no. be a Zoom call until I, I think at some point we will officially have like if we ever get together. We have to do an episode dedicated episode. Yeah. To, to doing it in the same room. What I find so funny about this is we grew up in the same hometown. Then we both moved away. And then we both end up weirdly finding out that we both lived in the same town in Orange County, California, uh, randomly found that out. Uh, but we didn't decide to start recording a podcast until I moved away to Texas, which is such a weird <laughs> how that happened. But uh, it's cool, though. I appreciate I'm happy to do it, even you know if one of us uh, lives in a really stupid state where it ruled by morons and i'm talking about me in texas by the way that's not that's not a uh that's, that's not an anti-california although you know i mean california is not perfect but uh you know, i live in orange county we're the texas of california so that's right exactly uh, very much <laughs> not to get too political but i don't i don't think anybody listening is ever really wondering where we lay so uh yeah. but anyways that's neither here nor there <laughs> Uh, That's we're, right. We're trying something a little different this time around, uh, and we're going to keep on doing it. We have a couple other minor experiments coming up as well in hopes that we can start to get this podcast on a more regular schedule. Uh, I don't know, we, we need yes. whatever the podcast equivalent of prunes is what the Den of Sin needs. We, we need to be more That's regular. Right. This, this uh, podcast <laughs> needs its fiber. But um, <laughs> nice analogy. <laughs> uh i've never had that problem personally i i'm too regular as uh anyway this is taking a weird direction but uh yeah we need to get the i agree we need this podcast to come out more often uh unfortunately because of the fact that i live where i live is there's hurricanes and tornadoes and st constant storms and uh, all these different scenarios it hasn't been making it easy but we do regardless we need to get back on track recording more consistently releasing them more consistently and i think the one of the better decisions that you made devin was to be have more forethought in the kind of episodes that we record and maybe not do six parters <laughs> <laughs> well that's you know we're 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 marking a, a sort of a soft anniversary for our show. Uh, we started recording last May with our, our first episode, Burt Reynolds. And uh, so happy soft anniversary, uh, James. I, I didn't get you anything, but maybe for I the, uh, maybe, maybe for the big one, uh, we, we recorded a few episodes before we actually started uh, posting them online. So uh, we'll maybe do something a little bit bigger for when that actual year comes up. But May was when we started recording. And so I figured it was a good time to start kind of experimenting because at that time we figured we were going to do these huge deep dives and that we weren't going to limit ourselves to genres or so, like we, we weren't going to limit ourselves to one particular kind of thing. It was our topic was going to yeah. be cinema. Uh, and I think we've done a pretty yeah. good job of that so far. But uh, in doing these deep dives, I, I think I've just set too high a bar for myself in wanting to really research every one of our topics uh, until the point that I've I've pulled up every bit of carpet in the home of the person that we're covering and uh you know try to find everything i can and see everything i can and um and i think that's a big part of why we've gone into these multi-parters and i don't want the multi-parters to go away necessarily but i think it'll hold us up if they continue no, to be our only focus so i think as of right now just kind of thinking out loud i think maybe we'll do one of those kinds of deep dives every month like one of the major ones like we sure. have been doing traditionally. And if it turns into a multi-parter, those are just bonus episodes. Uh, but that we might do some smaller episodes along the way just so that we can keep our, our ours and everybody else's interest going uh, with, with some other smaller topics. And we're going to have, like I said, some other experiments in the next couple of weeks leading up to our next uh, deep dive, which we'll announce soon. Uh, but for this episode, I wanted to try something I, I hesitate to call it a top five because I don't feel that it reflects our top five favorite of anything. It, it can, um, but I think 
in a in a very general way we're just talking about we we each we take a topic and the two of us come up with a, a list of five movies that are somehow pertaining to that topic but in a way that our individual lists cannot overlap um and that way it gives us each five movies to really uh to really cover i guess maybe we can if the uh if our big episodes are a film festival this would be more like a marathon uh, where we okay. might cover the best of a series or uh, some something along those lines. Uh, five different actors who have played one single character would be a fun one. Uh, but the, I for, like that one, yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be fun. But for our, our first one like this, uh, our first marathon, let's say, unless you have any objections to that name. No, no, I'm okay. Uh, well, we, we picked Hollywood history as our topic. Films about filmmaking and filmmakers. And uh, my list is the uh, five films about filmmakers that are fictitious. Now, they, they can be maybe loosely based on some facts or names can be disguised or things like that. But ultimately, these are fictional movies about fictional movies. <laughs> and then uh, you you pick the other side of that. Do you want to tell uh, everybody what your list is? Yeah, for those of you that probably couldn't figure out this hard mystery, uh, I... I decided to do five movies based off true Hollywood stories. Uh, so they are based off of actual factual events or actual, you know, specific filmmakers, but they are based off of some true history. Although, you know, Hollywood does love to play around with facts and reality and history and truth. But uh, but at the core of them, they're supposed to be based off true actual real actors or directors or specific, you know, films or, or what have you. We can get more into that when we get into the list, I guess. It is. It's, it's interesting, though, because as I was kind of looking through, um, we, we have access to each other's lists, so we aren't surprising each other here. Uh, but something that kind of started to dawn on me as I was looking through these things, I can't believe I didn't think of before, actually. If you take a true story about a filmmaker that came out, say, before 1990, there was probably less truth in that movie than there was about the movie's making fun of Hollywood that came before 1990 <laughs> or lampooning it or, or, you know, in any yeah. other way, you know, there, there's a lot more truth to some of this fiction than there was to some of the earlier bio films. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, I will say going into it, um, I, I tend to not gravitate towards traditional biopics because more often than not, they, they have to make concessions with not wanting to put too harsh of a light on certain realities. Um, and then some of them are real, like, neutered versions of those people's lives. And and also a lot of them are, like, just sort of saccharine or sort of very much, like, traditional oscar bait style films. And I don't usually gravitate towards a lot of traditional biopics. And especially for Hollywood, weirdly enough, it, it I was surprised to learn that I either I'm not a fan of a lot of the ones that are, like, Hollywood films based off of real Hollywood people either I'm not a fan of them or they're just not a lot of good ones. Um, so I had to make some concessions, which I will get into when I actually get into my list as far as how I chose the films or, or the specific types of films I, I chose. But yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, well, I don't want to, some of the films I want to talk about are specifically on your list as far as like, well, well, let's get into it. I feel like let's like, we've, we've given enough sort of background into this. Right. Let's, if you want to jump into it, I think, uh, I think, I think our listeners uh, are ready to uh, see our lists. All right, present lists. Uh, okay, okay. So James and I just had a private meeting and decided that we are going to alternate these titles rather than each one of us read our uh, full list. A little insider glimpse into how to make a podcast there on the fly. <laughs> Very professional. <laughs> well, I, so for the first one on my list of uh, fictional Hollywood films, that, that, that still doesn't seem like the quite the right way to say it, but. Hopefully by now people know what I mean. Uh, not based off of a true story. Well, even that's not accurate because some of them are sort of, but anyways, <laughs> fictionalized My, stories of Hollywood. Yes. Yes. I wanted to pick something of the classic era because um, there's just so many good movies about making movies in the classic Hollywood era that people already were loving this kind of story. I mean, if you go back, there's, there's all sorts of like uh there's musicals from the depression era. There's things like Sullivan's travels. You can get real dark, like sunset Boulevard, which might potentially be my favorite, but didn't make this list partly because I think it's a lot of people's favorites. 
but there's there's a lot of ground there and i chose to do the bad and the beautiful which was a uh, a 1952 film directed by vincent minnelli who himself directed cabin in the sky meet me in st louis uh an american in paris i mean if you don't know vincent minnelli then you probably are a person who doesn't care about much about classic cinema to begin with on the gossip end he's probably most known for being the father of liza minnelli who whose mother is judy garland but uh, he he was one of the great purveyors of melodrama. I mean, I, I, I think maybe bested only by Douglas Sirk. And, and even then only on a personal level, I, I prefer Douglas Sirk movies because those are the real, uh, what they used to call women's weepies, uh, where the, yeah. the melodrama is just dripping from the furniture. And Minnelli had that same sort of visual flair too. And, and uh, but, but did a lot more uh, musicals and, and comedies and things to go along that route. And Bad and the Beautiful was his take on the industry that made him. Uh, it stars Kirk Douglas as kind of the linchpin character. He's a producer. Uh, of course, all the pretty much everybody in Hollywood when this movie came out, it was a big deal. Everyone was trying to figure out who Kirk Douglas was subversively playing in this movie. It's probably David O. Selznick. But uh, there's reasons why people think it's Orson Welles, because Orson Welles' longtime partner, John Houseman, produced this movie. And the truth is probably that he's a combination of things. But uh, there were a lot of producers at the time who were probably claiming, that's me, uh, <laughs> even though uh, looking at it, uh, he's maybe not a character you want to admit that you're like. Yeah. And uh, the structure of it was interesting, because it's not just the story of one film getting made, per se. Uh, it's actually... Uh, these three other characters. One is a um, a writer becoming a director. The other is a young actress whose father was a big deal before her and is now gone, and she's kind of living in his shadow. And uh, the third one is a uh, novelist turned screenwriter who's been resisting making the switch because you know, there was a lot of snobbery back then about acclaimed authors who went into the gutter of Hollywood. And uh, so each each of these three people are telling their stories involving how they met and worked with this Kirk Douglas character and ultimately how they got screwed over by the Kirk Douglas character. And uh, by the end, you know, the Kirk Douglas character, he's not appearing in quote unquote current time uh, because none of them will speak to him, but he's trying to get them all wrangled together to work on one last movie together. And for which they would of course have to like sell out their own feelings of, angst and animosity that that are well deserved against his character uh but of course in the end they refuse to take the call together uh but then they go out into the other room like they're going to leave and they pick up the phone so they can listen in on the call because they're not out yet uh <laughs> each one of these characters was kind of based on somebody and and of course they're all archetypes the the woman is is based is supposed to be based off of um one of the barry moors for example and so for people who are classic film lovers, on top of it being a classic film itself, uh, for anybody that actually loves these kind of backlot stories, uh, you know, in, in uh, Hollywood Babylon and that kind of stuff, like I do, it, it's still a lot of fun to look at this and say, well, who's that supposed to be, you know, uh, who is that representing? And then Kirk Douglas, uh, who I, I know there's been some negative things said about Kirk Douglas, but man, the guy, the guy could act. There's just no yeah. denying uh, the guy had power and uh, Minnelli in this film, Douglas was starting to get a real reputation on screen anyways, for making a good uh, villain. And he was, and, and having the ability to switch from mellow to angry in about 2.5 seconds. Uh, and, and he was instructed, he was directed by Minnelli in this film to play it charming and boy, does he, you're watching this movie and you, you kind of want to be in his sphere. You want to be working with him. Uh, but at the same time, the writing's clearly on the wall. He's going to screw over anybody that he touches. So it was actually a very nuanced character for something that could have become very cartoonish. Yeah. So that, that was my pick for a classic. Uh, it was also followed up just to mention briefly, uh, they did do another film together, uh, Minnelli and Kirk Douglas and the writer um, got together again for a script called uh, Two Weeks in Another Town, in which Kirk Douglas this time plays an actor. And this was a little bit more of a uh, more Minnelli style visually. It wasn't a black and white. It was it was big and widescreen in color uh, and, and people didn't like it as much. But what's interesting is um, 
the actor in two weeks in another town is watching scenes from his previous movie and his previous movie was scenes from the bad and the beautiful, uh, which I know yeah, that's like. crazy. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and it's, and it's a fun movie. They didn't like it back then, but like uh, Jean-Luc Godard has called it one of his most influential movies. So, you know, it, it's really to different tastes and deservedly. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I, uh, I am a fan of uh, it's hard because, you know, not to get too heavy into the subject, but there's, yeah, some things have been, lobbied against uh kirk douglas that aren't so great uh well, which is putting it mildly some accusations that he was an abuser and stuff but um but man he is he he's hard not to like as an actor because he even beyond just what you would consider just traditional acting skills he just had so much charisma and some when he is on screen he just he you can definitely see why he was a huge star like he very uh and i even and again i i, I am a michael douglas fan as well um but I, there's something which I think they both have, but specifically for Douglas, just had this intensity or this like sort of magnetic charisma that uh, it's hard not to like, which is unfortunate because, as you said, some maybe not the greatest person, which, but that's for a different, that's for a different <laughs> episode, I guess. Um, but that's, oh, you know, I will, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I, I shouldn't go without shouting out Singing in the Rain, too. That almost ended up being my, my classic film because you can't get much more different than Sunset Boulevard than Singing in the Rain. <laughs> that's right. So I, I went somewhere in the middle, uh, but I take it you haven't seen this one. No, and I will. Uh, that's what I was about to say to our listeners. Uh, uh, I have only seen two of your five, uh, which is <laughs> not surprising. Um, you do have a tendency to go towards classic Hollywood, which, uh, while I do have an appreciation for, isn't necessarily what I would say was my wheelhouse. It's not that I don't appreciate those movies. I mean, I, I I really do have a strong appreciation, but there are so many of them. And for the longest time, you know, finding those films in any kind of format um, were hard. I feel like cable TV sort of really kind of when we were kids really didn't go back as far. Like there wasn't a lot of deep diving into older cinema the way there is now where there's there's a Roku channel for, you know, pretty much anything you can find streaming online, you know, movies of any generation. But, you know, when, HBO first started stuff. They would go as far back as maybe the '60s, but anything before that was just not readily available. So you had to really work for it more. And and I do. And I, you know, thanks to um, uh, Far from Heaven, which was the first time I sort of became aware of the Douglas Sirk style melodramas. That did make me go back and sort of look at more of the sort of traditional melodramas, which I do have appreciation for. But that's only because I saw, you know, uh, Far from Heaven, which was in basically a homage to Douglas Sirk films but um yes, brilliant but movie that's too. what yeah Todd fantastic Haynes. movie yeah yeah Todd Haynes when I think that Todd Haynes is best um uh and even though I am a Carpenter fan uh you know I I haven't watched Superstar in probably 20 years but it's not I don't know it's is it really a, I mean it's kind of a it's a legitimate movie I don't know it's got Barb it stars it, Barbie doll so it's definitely underground yeah but he's he but yeah Todd Haynes is a genius but I do think Far From Heaven is his best movie it's definitely his, his best looking movie but yeah the, the thing reason I like doing this podcast though is because uh, I always end up learning something and I always go away with like new movies to add to my must watch list but uh, no I haven't seen it yeah d- uh, definitely so, worth checking out if you get a chance to do you own it or did you find it available for streaming online uh you know I'll be honest with you it was something that I had stored in the back of my DVR like one of those ones way near the bottom that you forgets there. But uh, I have noticed that it plays a lot on Turner classic movies. If it's not available online, uh, it shouldn't be too hard to find. That literally was my, literally, I almost asked you, I'm like, cause that's the only place I can imagine it being available for <laughs> viewing. Thank God for Turner classic movies. At least they, they have been the, the repository for classic cinema. True. Um, and a big shout out to Criterion Channel, too, because I know I've seen this on the Criterion Channel. I just don't know if it's there because they they curate the Criterion Channel so fast. Yeah. I and dude, I love favorite. like we, um, you know, we, we we are annual subscribers. We do the annual thing for the uh, Criterion Channel. Uh, but man, the content comes and goes on there really quickly. Uh, or at least it feels that way. It's like because I'll, I'll see a movie that I want to see. Like I remember recently I was like, oh, De Palma's Sisters is on there. And then the next time I went to look for it, it was gone. So. Weirdly, I do multiple podcasts about cinema and film, and I have so little time these days to actually watch, uh, <laughs> or I don't end up using the time I have to watch as much as much movies as I'd like. So for my my first movie on my list, I went with Chaplin, which is a great movie. Uh, sort of was the movie that told the world Robert Downey Jr. was legitimately a talented actor, had was you know a legitimate valuable commodity in Hollywood. Post the film, he's struggled with you know his issues but uh thankfully he has 
turn those around. But I, you know, admittedly, my whole family is Robert Downey Jr. fans going back to weird science and what, you know, his 80s days, because there is some weird, I mean, I don't see it, but every male member of my family has been told we that there's a resemblance to Robert Downey Jr. My older brother and my twin brother get it more than I've gotten it, but I can understand those reasons. But anyway, so we've always sort of rooted for Robert Downey Jr. And I mean, again, if you, I mean, growing up back, uh, back to school is one of our favorite movies. And if you don't like Robert Downey Jr., Robert Downey Jr. in that movie, I don't have to, I don't have to tell you. He is, he is a special kind of genius. But so Chaplin is really distinct in the movie that shows because it's honestly less, even though it's, the sort of Chaplin, who's one of the most influential uh, d- directors, actors, whatever you want, creative forces in cinema history, was sort of helped really make cinema what it is. The film itself isn't really even well. Obviously, there's elements of like the way Hollywood works and things like that. The the film is sort of a weird. It's very much more of a character study or a biopic, and it's also it deals less with maybe Hollywood history and more like with McCarthyism and just his personal battles, Chaplin's personal battles, even in this stuff with women and stuff. Um, you know, I hadn't seen it in a long time and I rewatched it recently and, you know, it's got a great cast, but I feel like it's, he, it really is sort of hit like, you know, for the little bit that Danny Aykroyd is in it, he's good in it. Um, yeah, as Max. Uh, and, yeah, exactly. Very much a over the top kind of, you know, portrayal, um, very much a larger than life portrayal of a probably a legitimately larger than life character, but yes, um, yes, like yes. Anthony yes. Hopkins, yeah. Uh, Anthony Hopkins doesn't play a real human being in it. And he's just sort of, I'm not going to say he's wasted, but he's definitely, when you think Anthony Hopkins, he's sort of, you know, he's just, he has his quiet role or whatever. But outside of maybe Kevin Klein as Douglas Fairbanks, I mean, it really is, I mean, the whole film is really based off of Downey's performance. And, um, you know, I always get a little, I, I'm always a little trepidatious whenever I, I see an American playing a British uh, especially if there, it's an American playing as a real historical British character or, or uh, a real historical character who is, you know, um, as Charlie Chaplin was, you know, born in, in England. And and yeah, I don't know. I don't know how great Robert Downey Jr.'s accent is, but his portrayal is so amazing. When he transforms into specifically like the tramp, where you see the physicality of what Downey Jr. was able to do. In fact, there's this weird moment where Chaplin's sort of lambasting against talkies and like he's like how he's like the tramp will never talk and he does this whole thing about like why like i i I don't i forget the actual actual uh russian ballet dancer that he's doing an impression of but he's doing an impression of basically kind of you know equating like the mystique of the fact that ballet dancers don't talk but it's all physical performance but my point being uh is that robert Downey jr does this impression of this russian ballet dancer and it's amazing like he has all this like like it's just out of nowhere he has like he just does this and he's doing it in the film is sort of this kind of like comedic sort of sarcastic you know kind of impression of a ballet dancer but it's still amazing like he has this weird elegance and grace and like he for a second you're like does robert Downey jr is he a ballet dancer like right and it's just the physics yeah it's incredible um it's brilliant but it's like i don't know the first thing about ballet but he's good enough at it that i'm willing to buy that that's ballet like and that's the point of the performance is to... <laughs> exactly. You, you know, don't have to there's... know if this is ballet to know that it, he's being elegant. Exactly. Just he, how he physically embodies a character. And he really it's, did. It's so, yeah, it's amazing. And he de- definitely deserved the, the credit that he got for that. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of those scenarios where I think when he was cast, I think a lot of the goodwill towards the film and his performance specifically is that nobody saw him as an actor capable of doing that by that point, he had done things in Hollywood enough that he was still like a star or, or well-known, but you know, Charlie Chaplin had this, you know, had such a legendary figure, especially by the, you know, in the nineties the when this film was made, but you know, nobody, I don't think much like a uh, Heath Ledger playing the Joker. I don't, I, I think in the case when it was announced, people were like what the kid from weird science is, you know, playing Charlie Chaplin, that's stupid. And then, you know, he did such an amazing job with it, but you know, it's definitely a case of, um, you know, he they don't paint him necessarily as like a saint because, you know, he does some, you know, his relationship with the women is very troubled. His relationship with his mother. I, is I, th- troubled. I, I think his relationship with women was more or less fine. I think his relationship with girls was troubled. Uh, well, that's there you go. That's that was my point. <laughs> exactly. You know, and I, you know, they sort of excuse it a little bit in the film, which as, is like I said, as a lot of people did, even in the 90s, that sort yeah. of he. 
I'm just going to put it out there. Charles Chaplin, amazing mind, brilliant person, humanitarian, sexual groomer. Um, Yeah, for real. 100%. Yeah. And it's almost like the, the, he's almost the stereotype of it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, if that movie was made today, you know, I don't know if they go in any harder than they did in this film in so much as like, they make a point of saying that, you know, there's multiple scenes where they basically say like, dude, she's way too young and stuff. But again, part of the problem, my problem with biopic is that you're never going to really be as, I mean, very rarely you're going to see a film that is as truthful and as, you know, um, as, you know, you know, I, I, I get it. You know, when we have our heroes. We don't want to see them for the actual human beings that they are or whatever. In film, they still, it's, you know, you still want to, Oh, well, at the end of the day, as much as it's based on a real character, it's still he's still a, a real person. He's still a film character that you want your audience to root for. You know what I'm saying? There's still that concession that you have to make is like, which is again why I sort of stray usually stray away from um biopic style films. There is one that is also on this list, which I feel well, I'll save that for when I get to it. But unlike some of the other films on my list, I while I feel this is very important to hit film in general, it does speak to film history, especially the importance of early film. I mean, you know, Chaplin was the first megastar. He's one of the most important, you know, characters in film history. So for that reason, again, that was one of the reasons I chose it. He's um, practically the mascot of Hollywood. He's- absolutely. I almost said that. Exactly. Yes. You know, and, and again, like, I do think, even though this film, like, there's a lot of it has to do with McCarthyism and stuff. I think that's also a big thing with, it wasn't just Chaplin dealing with that in film history. I mean, some incredible talent truly suffered at the hands of fucking those pieces of shit human beings. Um, fucking yeah. McCarthy and fucking, yeah, anyways. Um, still, I get my, gets my blood boiling. But, um, but yeah, so, but I still think it definitely warranted a place on my list because, especially in the vein of, of biopics, there aren't a lot of, I feel like, truly valuable ones about Hollywood. You know, there's ones about, you know, in the entertainment industry, tons about, you know, I think singers and musicians are probably the most prevalent in all of, you know, biopic history. When you really look at the history of the biopic in, in Hollywood, a lot of them seem to focus on rock and roll musicians and musicians in general, which is very weirdly specific, but I, I guess I see yeah. it. You know, I definitely think, while it's not a perfect movie, I definitely think it's a great movie and it because of you know the subject matter and how important Charlie Chaplin is to cinema, you know, I felt like it was a perfect film to put on my list. Absolutely. I'm glad you did. It's a good movie. Um, I'm going to jump uh, way ahead here uh, in, in time. Uh, it's not contemporary. I'm going to try to do these mostly because they aren't in a best to worst or, or vice versa order. I'm going to do them chronologically. But the next one I have is 1975's Hearts of the West. I don't know if uh, you've seen this. I... I doubt most people have seen this. This is one of those. I hadn't even heard of it until you put it on your list. And I was like, what? Hollywood has largely forgotten this movie. Uh, I, I, it, it's on cable all the time. It's another one. You'll probably tur- turn on Turner classic movies right now. And my guess is you will find either Pat and the beautiful or hearts of the West. Good to know. And it's, it's a, uh, it's another one that kind of takes place near about the same era as Chaplin. I think it's a, it's a few years after the little tramp has been established as a character, but it's uh, really kind of the early days of, of Westerns and it's directed by Howard Zeif Zeff. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, Howard Z I E F F. Uh, I, I primarily mentioned, well mention him because he deserves the credit, but I also mentioned him because he directed the dream team, uh, which we spoke about uh, a That's couple right. of weeks ago, uh, which I still, I have my, blu-ray for you sitting by the door in an envelope i just haven't made it out to ups yet no worries <laughs> uh but of note he also did uh private benjamin with uh goldie hahn which was a huge hit of 1980 and uh, uh my girls one and two so which were notorious for people our age i, I yes. don't know if anybody knows uh my girl that wasn't uh, in middle school in the i've never seen the same but you're really not missing anything the first one's really cute the first one is a legitimately good movie uh, the second one, I, I don't, I don't think there's anything really to remember it for. Uh, but for this movie, I, I don't know why this director didn't do more work. I, perhaps I, I'm, I don't know much about the stage unless it pertains to filmmaking. Uh, so maybe he <laughs> did a lot on Broadway or something. Uh, but he seems to be an, a, a pretty talented director. And uh, this movie itself was actually on the National Board of Reviews top ten films for 1975. So it did receive accolades at its time. It's just that proverbial movie they don't make anymore 
uh, and in it, uh, Jeff Bridges, very young Jeff Bridges, uh, plays kind of a um, a nobody farmer out in the Midwest somewhere, and he uh, he wants to be a writer. He wants to be a Western writer specifically. Uh, he wants to write novels, and so he he decides that he needs to go west because he needs to have experience to put into his novels so that he can be like you know his heroes like Zane Gray. And so he goes out in search of a, a correspondence school that he's signed up for. He figures, well, they've been accepted for the correspondence school. I, maybe if I show up, they'll like let me hang out and, and it won't have to be correspondence. I can be there. And of course, to find that the correspondence school is a P.O. box and the whole thing was a scam. And uh, through a set of circumstances, he ends up pissing off the people, of course, who are running said scam. Uh, and and he has to go on the run. And uh he ends up stealing a car to get away from these guys in, in like a, a legitimate, I mean, it's a freaky thing. He's not overreacting. Uh, these guys are coming after him. Uh, but when he, when he gets where he's going, he really, he's in Hollywood or he's not quite in Hollywood. He's on the outskirts of Hollywood where they're filming the Westerns, uh, which nowadays, I mean, this is all like out in the canyons where you and I grew up. Uh, but uh, that kind of terrain, that, rugged sort of desert terrain used to stretch much further out into Hollywood before it got urbanized. And so he gets caught up on a, um, on a Western set uh, with the stuntmen uh, and watching a, a stunt take place, which of course he thinks is real at first and <laughs> thinks he's in bigger danger than he is. And the head stuntman of this movie is played by Andy, Gr- Andy Griffith. And this is at the heart of why I picked this because I feel like there just aren't enough good roles for Andy Griffith in mainstream Hollywood. Uh, he's one of my all-time favorite performers. Uh, his stand-up, his albums, the Andy Griffith show is always going to have a, a special place in my heart. It, it's in my top five sitcoms of all time to this day, and it will never leave my top five. Uh, and, and then, of course, A Face in the Crowd. I love A Face in the Crowd so much. I, I've Multiple times I've almost gotten a tattoo of Andy Griffith's profile cackling on the poster for A Face in the Crowd. Uh, so uh, facing the crowd was a really great expose on the politics of television. So I'll, I'll leave it off of this list. So prescient, so yes. fucking prescient to this day. Uh, real quick, because I, I, I want to interject. Uh, you were the first person you showed that film to me. It became one of my and my wife's favorite movies ever. One of my favorite performances ever. One of the most amazing films. Also, weirdly, also attached to McCarthyism. Yes. Um, you know, I, I only really knew Andy Griffith of the, the show and then, you know, um, his sort of, uh, yeah, like you said, comedy albums. Didn't know the kind of actual performer and didn't know about his like stage performance and stuff that you, but again, Facing the Crowd, one of the best. I, I, I've actually argued online that I think it is the greatest American film ever made. I really do believe start to finish the fact of how prescient it still is is incredible. And I think, I mean, performances, every, I think it's one of the greatest movies ever made. Yeah, it, it's I've, I've seen the look on so many faces when I said, did you know that Andy Griffith was robbed of an Oscar? Uh, <laughs> even people that love the Andy Griffith show, they don't, they don't see the power Andy. that he had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but Andy, I mean, and talk about, you could not get a more different character from Sheriff Andy to Lonesome Roads. They are completely opposite characters in uh, so many ways. Anyways, I, I had to interject because, that was a movie that I'd never heard of until you told me about it, watching it at the, for, you know, for our listeners, there was a period in uh, my life and amongst a lot of our friends' lives where we would go to the Devon's uh, apartment and basically it was like film school. It was just, <laughs> just, uh, we would just watch black exploitation movies and, you know, and stuff. And of all the films that you, you know, you sort of turn me on to one of a face in the crowd is I, I legitimately think, I honestly think it deserves the place of the number, the, number one best American made film of all time. I, I find it hard to argue against that. I, I agree. Um, and one of these days we'll get a chance to deep dive into that one too. For now, like I said, it, it's a really good expose <laughs> on, on television, which is not what we were doing. Uh, but no, he sort is of in hearts tan- of the West. Tangentially, but yes, yes. Okay. Back other, on track. <laughs> yeah. Uh, otherwise network would be on the table too. And that's another one that we need to talk about someday, but uh, back to hearts of the West, uh, <laughs> just, just to do this is uh, I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short. Cause this is in theory supposed to be the faster podcast. Uh, but <laughs> uh, no, Andy Griffith is in this. He's not the lead, but it is another part where he's playing somebody who's rougher around the edges than Andy. 
Uh, you get to hear him use a couple of curse words. That's always fun. But he becomes kind of a mentor character to Jeff Bridges, Western writer, who now ends up getting stuck as being, quote unquote, stuck as being a new Western action star, all while these people are still trying to chase him down for the money that he took in the car when he escaped from them from their fraudulent correspondence school. Uh, and Andy ends up becoming somebody who kind of doesn't just uh, bring him into being an actor, but but Jeff Bridges' character learns that this writer who he hoped to find when he came out to California or when he, when he came West, uh, he hoped to maybe meet this Western writer who had kind of disappeared. And of course, lo and behold, Andy is that character uh, and turns out to not be quite as noble of a character as he's portraying himself. Uh, So uh, it's, while it's not going directly into kind of antagonist territory, like Lonesome Roads does in Face in the Crowd, to see Andy play someone who has a cowardly streak, a miserable son of a bitch side to him, uh, that's still always highly entertaining. And he always nails it. He always does just as well with that as he does with any of his uh, warm, fuzzy, sweet natured, yeah. Paw to the whole town, sort of. Exactly. <laughs> America's, America's dad. He wasn't just Opie's dad, he was Mayberry's dad. We all know that. That's right. Yeah. If you get a chance, Hearts of the West, will it change your life? No, but you'll. You'll enjoy your your time watching it. Some really great performances, a quaint little movie that time has somehow forgot. I mean, the plot is so very 70s, especially with the sort of on the run sort of (laughs) element, which is cute. I mean, I I can appreciate that. And again, even the bad guys chasing them, the the bad guys chasing them aren't hardened 70s. Like they aren't escapees from the French connection. They're 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 70s sort of slapsticky sort of like. They're played by a couple of guys who you've probably seen a million times playing the uh, goofy goons on TV shows. Uh, okay. They're played for laughs just as much, but uh, uh, very a lot of heart in, in the title like and that. in the story. Yes, it, it's a a sweet little movie. Well, from one heart uh, of to another heart of uh, <laughs> my uh, next movie is Hearts of Darkness. You know, one of the most talked about documentaries ever made, um, especially yeah. around Hollywood. It's one of the rare examples of critically, I think the documentary is just as beloved as the actual film. It's a documentary of yeah. as maybe, uh, you know, maybe more, even more so. I, I will say I was never a huge fan of Apocalypse Now. I do. I was a huge fan of uh, uh, the Apocalypse Redo or whatever. But it, there's so much to unpack here. I, I, this could be a whole episode in and of itself, as I'm sure you would agree, but uh, just an amazing documentary um, about a time that will never exist again. Coppola is such a unique character in film history anyways, where how he started to where he went. Like, I would definitely say the last great, truly great, I don't love everything he did. Um, I think like things like Rumblefish, I think are fucking brilliant. And I think he doesn't get enough credit for, her, but obviously he's the guy that, you know, directed the godfather film so he didn't really need to do much after that anyways to really you know sort of cement himself but i mean his whole fucking family's in film now and um he's a legacy is, yeah yeah absolutely he's like a dynasty really um Dyna- yes you're right but i will say one thing that i i really have such an appreciation for him is that you know he probably wasn't the easiest person to work with or to deal with and he was very much he even some of the things that he sort of subjected some of his actors to or allowed to happen on on the film um much publicized you know especially with uh martin sheen and stuff but one thing is just so fascinating is just watching his journey with that movie with i mean he's he, at one point talking about the movie while it was in production he was saying it was going to be shit it was going to be the worst movie like his relationship to his art it was very fascinating because he wasn't you know he he, he had such a complex and complicated relationship with film and what with his own film and his opinion about making film and i mean he i think he saw himself as a real artist and wanted to really make you know um at one point in the you know in the documentary basically uh, i forget who's retelling the story if it was um it was a dennis hopper but basically at one point he said that he thought this was gonna that apocalypse now was gonna be the first film ever nominated for a fucking um nobel peace prize and you can definitely <laughs> like yeah that's part of who he is like he had you know he had these grand illusions um, I think it was John Milius who made that comment. Was it John Milius? 
I think it might. Oh yes, they, it was. Yeah, that's right. He was the one that was saying about how because he was ready to go in there and basically, you know, uh, try to convince Coppola that he was insane, and then he came out like he was all like, you know, uh, inspired. <laughs> but uh, and then the whole thing with the John Milius is so fascinating because you know John Milius, as much as I, I am a fan of Milius's work or some of his work, you know, he was this like big, loud, brash, conservative, right wing dude who was very much pro military, pro war, and you know it's that's eventually not where the film went at all and just a fascinating the fact that like you know he he let the you know the the film itself takes place from footage from the actual filming of it because his famously he told his wife to sort of make this documentary as she says either to uh, keep me uh busy or i forget what was the other thing about saving money somehow because you know it Francis Ford Coppola paid for that movie out of his pocket, which is, you know, which was sort of unheard of at the time and very like, you know, he was, it's it's I, I honestly, I, yeah, ex- yes, exactly. It was fully insane. I can't properly talk about it in the, a short amount of time outside of just to say, I mean, it's one of the most, number one, the situation will never happen again, where if a director of his caliber was financing his own film for little money, dealing with the most insane people and insane circumstances and, you know, um, just everything about it is just pure insanity. But the the fact that, like, you know, he had such a singular vision was going to make this movie based off of one of the most complicated, you know, the history of trying to make uh, an adaptation of Heart of Darkness in the first place, of, like, trying to get that movie made, you know, famously, um, uh, I, I'm, I can't remember every director that tried, but, you know, most famously... Orson uh, Welles. Orson Welles gave up on it, so... Uh, but I know a few other directors tried, but just a fascinating film and really kind of like the fact that, you know, because this wasn't like a documentary that was taking place necessarily just, I mean, a lot of the footage in the interviews were, you know, decades later, but so much of the actual footage, you know, filmed at the time. And, you know, because of it being Coppola's wife, a lot of like really insane personal moments were captured. And But just all of the, you know, just the things with, firing Harvey Keitel and then rehiring and then everything, you know, with this whole dot, this, we could do a whole episode just about, you know, everything that went on with Martin Brando and his insanity, <laughs> which I'm going to go on record as saying, I love Brando as far as I do. I, you know, I'm a fan of his performances, uh, but I, I, there, I've seen people online that basically were like, you know, Brando's a genius. So he, he can do whatever he wants. Fuck that. Like no level of genius allows you to be that kind of a pain in the ass. Like, yes, he was a naturally gifted actor. One of the most dynamic young actors, you know, of his time. But, you know, he he's a pain in the ass. Like, and I, I mean, God bless anybody who worked with him. But uh, so my biggest thing is he used to be the most handsome man in history and then ended up a fucking boglin. He like most mashed potatoes <laughs> up in the motherfucker. But, um, but God damn, that, that fall from grace, is, it's, it's crazy. A man, fall from grace that a, arguably started here. I mean, I, there's stories of him oh, yeah. misbehaving on the set of, of various things long prior to this. Uh, but this was kind of the first time that he got any on him so to speak yeah. uh in the yeah. eyes of the public uh this movie was not a huge hit when it came out uh no apocalypse no. now that is yes um it was interesting while i was watching it it started to dawn on me in a weird way it's this it's the opposite side of to the same coin as 2001 a space odyssey because they they represent um something from a from a very early portion of my favorite time for filmmaking against the very end of my favorite time of filmmaking, the uh, kind of mid sixties through the uh, early eighties was, was really by, by a lot of people's standards, really the glory days of mainstream filmmaking. I agree a thousand percent. And you look at the control of Kubrick on 2001 uh, versus the chaos, (laughs) pure chaos of, of apocalypse now, but one really is about the, evolution literally evolution of culture into almost machinery and the other is about the de-evolution of human beings down to like our basest almost subhuman levels Uh, so they they represent the light and the dark they are a yin and yang combo and even in their their reception over time uh, because 2001 was not beloved when he came out no it was panned yes 
so people had higher expectations of Kubrick and people had higher expectations of Coppola, but time has been very kind to these films. They're now considered masterpieces of, of not just visual style, but, but also uh, technical achievement and, and uh, artistic achievement and, and pretty much anything that you can lob into filmmaking as an achievement. These two films are, are really kind of known for. So I, I, I would yeah. like to see a double feature of that. Actually, I take it back. That would probably put me to sleep. But I, I <laughs> but I like discussing these two films as as odd parallels. Yeah, it's funny. I've never. I mean, that's a, a really interesting point. But I mean, as far as like you said, how they were received, especially these two very well, especially at the time, very well respected, very highly regarded directors. It wasn't until rewatching. I mean, yes, obviously, it's because of the subject matter, because of the war and the famously like, you know, strafing, like, you know, as they're filming and this, it has an intensity and this sort of, a, you're on edge watching the whole film, but I forgot how fucking beautiful the, sh- the shot of Sheen when he's like emerging from the water and all the fog is sort of sitting on the mm-hmm. water. That, that looks like a shot that was filmed yesterday. I mean, it's amazing. Like, the There's a reason why stuff, these two films have both been rushed to 4k as soon as the, uh, technology yeah. was available both of those films have, have very worthy 4k discs I, I think the chaos of not knowing exa- i mean you know as coppola was rewriting it you know every day like you know there was no like you said where something like 2001 with, with everything kubrick did was so meticulous and so planned out and everything was preconceived where fucking apocalypse now was literally pure chaos it was it was uh you know actors were having breakdowns nobody knew what the fuck they were supposed to be doing like people just sort of the half a cast was deep on drugs and but there, there know, were like, fucking monsoons uh, <laughs> yeah exactly but it sort of really does lend this authenticity and this true you know watching the apocalypse now you get really you're on e like if you're watching and you're invested in the film you're you're on you're on edge even on the quiet moments you're on edge because the film seems like it's like traveling down this fucking path of insanity, but uh, it's not yeah, pleasant. It's, it's that's no. there, there are lots yeah, of words for Apocalypse for now, fun. but it, yeah, it's not a pleasant movie. But but neither is two thousand one, and no, exactly. and and I think uh, fans of both. Well, there there are lots of movies we talk here that people uh, people either love them or hate them. Two thousand one and Apocalypse Now have in common that there's a group of people that love them, and everybody else just kind of acknowledges its brilliance and moves on (laughs) there's just there's not really a set of detractors from these anymore uh everyone just kind of says yeah it's great it's just not my thing but but you you're hard pressed to find anybody to say i absolutely hate apocalypse now i will say though you know i i watching the the documentary it's very telling that as connecting with real human history and real human truth and seeing like there's so many things in the documentary where you're not you're just seeing a glimpse of either an actor sort of pacing you know when they're filming or you just you know see the physical stress on people's faces or whatever and that's to me just as captivating as the actual film as you know the film it's talking about itself there's the human drama of of the film and stuff to me is just as interesting as the fictionalized version the fictional story that the, the film is telling but that's so rare that you get, you know, like in Hearts of Darkness, where you get a documentary about Hollywood, about things we know about. That is, you get where you get that glimpse or that view of things happening at the time. And, you know, because a lot of the film takes place, it's after the fact interviews and stuff and telling it from, you know, a uh, the a perspective of, you know, at the time, a con- you know, these actors and producers and everybody were in the 90s telling the story of what happened. But the, the film, the footage actually from the 70s, in the Philippines with people where you just use the whole sequence where uh, Coppola is basically, the, it's that French sequence. And, you know, it's, and I think that scene's brilliant and the way it looks is great, but fucking Coppola is just shitting all over, admitting like, Oh, I, 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 I got rid of that scene because I was mad that like we had to cut our budget, but the, you know, the um, design or not the design, the, um, uh, the set, the set decor, like the set people and everybody, they had their budget. So he was just mad at that scene. So he cut out just out of pure, I don't know, just cut off his nose despite his own face sort of thing. But just seeing how frazzled and angry he was, is just so, like, it's just crazy. The only thing I can compare it to is just the footage of, weirdly, of Kubrick and The Shining and that footage of the documentary that his daughter was making, that same rawness that you just sort of like, oh, like, I don't think I'm supposed to be seeing this sort of feeling, which is... um and it was really captivating, really, and it's really, and, it, I, and I think it's 
one of the best documentaries made about uh, Hollywood. And I think it's just a phenomenal documentary period. So Agreed. Uh, now, there might be some people who don't necessarily agree with my next choice as being a great movie, but I, I will always love this movie. SOB by Blake Edwards coming out in 1981. This movie... <laughs> This movie's kind of autobiographical, so there's really, it's almost disingenuous to say that it's not based on a true story, because it's definitely based on true instances and true personalities and and things like that, but it's autobiographical, and the names have all been changed, and and the actors have all been changed, except for one very notable one. I I actually think it's, it's ultimate companion piece from the same era would be All That Jazz by Bob Fosse. Uh, which was also autobiographical and and touches on filmmaking, but really is more about the stage. But uh, what Blake Edwards did with SOB and Bob Fosse also did with all that jazz was offer a a real raw portrayal of themselves as the title character that ultimately ends in that character's death. So these living directors who at the time did not have anything terminal, they're both gone now. But uh, these directors di- got a chance to direct their own death sequences, which has got to be one of the most cathartic things I can think of. In the case of SOB, we, we tend to think of it as son of a bitch because that's the the most accepted uh, use of, of those initials, SOB. But in this context, it actually stands for standard operational bullshit. And uh, it's Blake Edwards' own reaction to having produced and directed uh, and in many cases written some of the biggest Hollywood blockbusters of all time uh, on this list are, are the Pink Panther movies, the Days of Wine and Roses, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And uh, then he makes one movie, Darling Lily, that flops, starring his wife, Julie Andrews. The movie does not do well, and suddenly Blake Edwards found himself being treated like garbage in the town that he had kind of bankrolled for the last 10 years. And so... He went into a very rebellious phase and he made this movie out of it in which he cast his wife again, Julie Andrews, in a part uh, where she plays an actress who is known for her more Disney sort of persona. And in this movie, she's not Mary Poppins. She's she's Peter Pan. And the great Richard Mulligan plays the uh, Felix, the uh, the surrogate for Blake Edwards in this who is the director going through the depression. In fact, he's suicidal. And I know there's nothing funny about suicide, but every now and again, in those early eighties comedies, Burt Reynolds did one too. Some of the funniest scenes are the scenes where he's failing at suicide. Um, but <laughs> he, he's able to pull himself out of this funk by, by coming up with the idea that he's going to recut his flop, but he's going to refilm it too. And he's going to refilm a, a saccharine sort of uh, do goody sort of, song and dance sequence with his wife and now it's going to be shot with uh the climax of her ripping her top off so this is the movie about julie andrews doing a nude scene in which julie andrews does actually do a nude scene and it's i don't know if you've ever seen it that that was kind of what it was famous for at the time but i think that that's actually a minor part of the story itself it's almost excessively funny. It's so, especially if you know some of the people that these people are pretending to be. It's got this incredible ensemble cast. On top of Julie Andrews and Richard Mulligan, who I've already mentioned, uh, William Holden's final screen performance, uh, Robert Weber, Robert Preston, who's my favorite in the movie, Larry Hagman from Dallas and I Dream of Jeannie, Robert Loja, uh, Robert Vaughn, Shelley Winters, Rosanna Arquette, um, even Paul Stewart from Citizen Kane finds his way into this movie it pretty much everybody was in this movie at the time sending sending up hollywood and it has some of the funniest dialogue have you ever seen sob james no it's it it was one of the three i hadn't seen that i had actually heard of it's funny i i still can only the second i see richard mulligan's face all i can think about is empty nest it's literally the first thing i can ever i ever associate with but you know blake edwards is amazing so it's the one on this list that i was like oh yeah i I should watch that even before you start talking about it because i like i said i knew about it but um i didn't know she uh i didn't know his (laughs) i didn't know she actually showed her boobs in it that's uh yes i didn't know that yeah it's it's a little bit it's a little bit um controversial as a lot of blake edwards is nowadays um i mentioned blake edwards did breakfast at tiffany's uh which means that he was capable of doing a lot of beautiful things and then taking a giant racially insensitive shit on top of the entire proceedings 
and yes. SOB has also uh, its its problematic moments. There's a brown pa- face performance by Larry Storch at the very end. Uh, not nearly. Nothing could know. be as on the same level. Nothing. Nothing could be nothing's on. The, and, and and to be fair, Edwards before he passed away, Edwards was emphatic that he would never do Breakfast at Tiffany's that way again, and that he made a huge mistake. Uh, this was. It's it's almost ironic that he kind of continued to make similar mistakes in lighter fashions, uh, but it was never seen to be coming from like like it was disturbing no matter what. But it didn't seem to be coming from a disturbing place. He wasn't trying to be mean. He was trying to be broad and funny, and it it fails at that and comes off as mean. Um, I, I was glad that he walked back the Mickey Rooney is Mr. Yoshi thing. Uh, he never walked back Larry Storch playing a Maharaji at the end of this movie. But thankfully, it doesn't stand out as much. It's not throughout the movie. It's one scene um, kind of sending up the the Maharaji that the Beatles would go to visit yeah. doing the stereotypical accent. And and there is there actually are a couple of Asian actors in this, but they're they're mocked at one point by kind of a bitchy character who who does the old R and L switcheroo, which yeah, it's racist. But uh, I'll also confess, growing up in the eighties, I thought it was funny. So I, I apologize on the behalf of white culture for egging yes. that on for so long, uh, because we like things that are silly, and that comes off as sounding silly without being noticed to, to somebody who was at least as small as I was at the time as being exactly. horribly insensitive and, and yeah. just not getting it. Um, so I don't want to mar the movie. Uh, I think it's, it's a perfectly watchable movie, um, but I, I don't want people to go in without the heads up. And then the, the nude scene yeah. itself, they have to give her Robert Preston's my favorite character in the whole movie. He's the doctor and he's got everybody's drugs, uh, including his own. So you know, he'll do things like, uh, you know, he'll inject somebody with with something that, that's that's going through depression. And then he'll turn around and say, take note if he begins to levitate and walk out of the room. Uh, so he's, he's always there with the zingers and the one liners. And they have to bring him in because Julie Andrews character is getting so nervous about her topless shot. And so he 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 gives her something that makes her a little bit looser, uh, which nowadays obviously we would see that as oh you don't want to do the scene of course you don't have to do the scene in the context of this film it was you have to do the scene we've sold this on the scene bring in the doctor um and to be honest julie andrews some of her funniest stuff and she knew this she knew this going in some of her funny funniest stuff is leading up to the nude scene of her acting high Cause she knew that that was just as out of character for, for her as the new yeah. scene was. So she played it to the nines and, and that's really what saves it. That's what kind of keeps it from being a creepy thing, but in real life it would be a creepy thing. <laughs> so definitely a product of its time. And I, and part of why I picked it too, uh, not to get even more long winded, but I have to point out William Holden's one of my favorite actors of all time. And there are probably no other actors who are more closely associated with playing screenwriters uh, out of classic Hollywood. Uh, William Holden was a screenwriter in Sunset Boulevard. He was a screenwriter in Paris when it sizzles. And in this, he finally gets to play a director. Uh, so I, I had to uh, put this on the <laughs> list just so that there was, a, there had to be a Holden somewhere, a Holden film somewhere. So I, I'd go with the one where he uh, has some William Holden. Yeah. Yeah, where he moved. And he's hysterically funny, too. He's so self-deprecating and talking about his own abuses and, and uh, drinking and drug problems as a character in the movie. So it's eye-openingly honest, but at the same time, it's just as dishonest as anything else coming out in the early 80s. So it it's kind of fun. But you would be yeah, fun to I watch mean, it with. I would love to watch it with you. I'd love to save that to point but who, uh Distance makes that a little hard. I guess we could do a virtual. I mean, people do that, right? The virtual watch parties. Yeah, we can do that. You know, maybe we can, Mm. if we, if we get our Patreon set up, maybe we can start doing some audio commentary exclusives. I would love to do that. I, I would, I actually thought about that exact thing. So we got to get that Patreon. So for our subscribers, if you are, if you are interested in supporting a Patreon, let us know in our social media. Uh, let us know if that's something you're interested in, but I would love to get a Patreon started and sort of do some some fun extras that we wouldn't normally do for the actual podcast itself. But uh, it, very interesting movie uh, just for Mary Poppins 
boobs alone. It's very. Uh, <laughs> I will not also not going to uh, to to uh, be dishonest and say I I googled it as soon as. <laughs> soon as soon as you said i i googled it uh so but very interesting very fascinating interesting choice like i said it was the one on this list i had, i just heard about but i don't know how i never heard about that specific that that you actually <laughs> anyways that's this is getting we- really weird but but yeah we would we, i would love to watch it with you we should figure that out we should figure out a way to watch it together uh so for my next movie uh, i'm going to talk about uh a movie i do love uh it's the only one on here though that i haven't seen recently um, so it's not as fresh in my mind, but I saw it in the theater. I, I do love it. And it's the kid stays in the picture. Uh, the sort of very notorious, uh, it's based off of the autobiography by Hollywood legend, Robert Evans, uh, who I did first learn about because of Mr. Show, uh, didn't, you know, I mean, never heard Bob Evans, you know, as a, as a man in my twenties, but, uh, famously an episode of Mr. Show. In fact, it's my favorite episode of all of Mr. Show. Mr. Show has a whole sketch where it's basically God recording his autobiography, and it's and it's literally just Bob Odenkirk doing a Robert Evans impression uh, with using some almost verbatim quotes from Robert Evans, which is hysterical. Uh, but yeah, that episode, by the way, is my all-time favorite Mr. Show episode because I do love that skit. And then the following skit is Monster Pajama Party, which is my all-time favorite Mr. Show skit, um, <laughs> which does have a uh, a an homage to a friend of yours. Uh, yes. <laughs> Dr. Retarded. I, I, it's not very on PC, but it's still, I, one of the hardest I've ever laughed at anything was when Dr. Retarded popped up. Um, anyways, different conversation for a different day, but uh, based off of Robert Evans, very long autobiography about his incredible career. I mean, granted one of the most incredible careers of anybody who's ever worked in Hollywood. I actually think it's one of the best documentary. It's such a beautifully composed documentary, what they were able to do with it, because obviously a lot of the footage, you know, they, they only had still photos for, and a lot of it was, they, they managed to make these sort of animated photo sequences. that are just beautiful. And, you know, I think you could only do that movie with Evans himself doing the narration. I don't think it could have worked. I don't think a documentary about nobody was able to cap. I mean, he was such a unique, the way he spoke, his voice, his like kind of bullshit. Like if the whole, like the the adage of like somebody believing their own bullshit, that adage was created for Robert Evans. He's definitely, Bob Evans was so up his own ass, but in the most glorious way possible. But, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, you know, and weirdly enough, I didn't think about it until I was talking about uh, Hearts of Darkness, but, you know, those two dudes notoriously did not get along for a long yes. time. Robert Evans was a producer on the Godfather film. They had a very uh, contentious uh, working relationship. Apparently, though, I guess when Evans died, Coppola actually gave a very emotional and nice uh, eulogy about him, which is nice that they sort of put that to rest or whatever. But for a long time, they were definitely, they were very not friends. In fact, I, I I, if I'm not mistaken, I at one point I guess the rumor was that uh, Coppola wanted to, to to have star in Apocalypse Now. He wanted uh, um, Steve McQueen solely because he knew it would piss off Robert Evans. <laughs> That's <laughs> that is a story I read. But what a brilliant documentary about you know a guy that was literally you know you said it earlier the greatest era in film history for me, especially for American Western cinema, is you know the 70s to the you know mid 80s late sixties, but, and that's really where, I mean, Robert Evans was doing his thing, literally that time frame. He was sort of uh, involved in some of my favorite movies ever, Rosemary's Baby, which is one of my all time favorite films, huge films, you know, he, his career had some amazing ups and downs, how he got started as an actor. And, you know, he, you know, he's just this good looking, you know, you know, business guy. And then he kind of lucked into being an actor and he was discovered a, by the pool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very, very famously, like, yeah, lounging at the pool. And again, he was a handsome guy, charismatic, not the greatest actor. I don't think, you know, rewatching some of his roles, I don't think he was terrible. But, you know, at the time, I think people saw him as just some, you know, handsome, you know, vapid one note guy. And he went on to be one of the most infamous producers and in Hollywood characters in history. And actually, uh, before I lose the point, um, got his start playing one of the biggest producers at Universal Studios in his first feature as an actor, uh, a film about making movies. That's uh, right. Man, Man with a Thousand Faces about Lon Faces. Chaney. Chaney, which is a movie. I, in fact, I, when I was uh, putting this list together, um, because there's so like, I was like, oh man, I need to rewatch Apocalypse Now. Like there, there's like all these movies and that's one of them. Cause goddamn, I mean, Lon Chaney, uh, is, I love Lon Chaney anyways, but um, 
where, where, where was I though? <laughs> oh yeah, no. Okay. So, but yeah, again, I, it, this this podcast is going to be long enough. I don't need to pontificate too much about uh, the kid stays in the picture. But you know, he's such an uh, he's such an interesting human. Be- he he was. He has passed away. But uh, Bob Evans is unlike any. I mean, he's just one of a kind human beings. The way he spoke, his whole persona. You know, he's a good looking dude that was famously romanticized a lot of beautiful women. He's just such a character. He he sort of embodies everything that you think about Hollywood. Robert Evans really was sort of, I mean, he embodies everything. So, but it is a brilliant documentary that sort of touches upon, you know, some of the best films ever made, whether it's Godfather, the, you know, Chinatown, Rosemary's Baby, you know, his sort of rise to fame and his, you know, fall from glory and then sort of his comeback. And like, it's, just a, it's a great documentary. I feel like if you don't, if you're not, uh, somebody who's a huge Hollywood film buff, you would still enjoy it as a documentary because it's just an entertain. His life story is really entertaining. But if you are a fan of Hollywood and you've never seen it in Hollywood history, it's a fucking, it's, it's such a great fun film. Like I said, I, I saw it in the theaters when it was brand new. I bought the, the film and released on DVD. And I, I literally used to watch, it was one of my go-to sort of like, oh, I'm not feeling well. Let me put on uh, the kids in the picture just because, you know, it's such a fun it's, it's, he's, he's so silly he's like a fucking caricature of a hollywood producer but he's you know just his he's got such a great voice for a narrator too he was like this sort of like see it's just he, i don't it, i it, i love the movie and i i you know despite his many flaws uh, i do love robert evans so same here and, and you're he's he's like every stereotype in one neat little package of a Hollywood yep. producer with the slick back hair and the cigarette and the, you know, uh, <laughs> the sunglasses and on the big sunglasses and, and he calls people baby. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, kind of guy you think was probably born under a palm tree and uh, <laughs> says things like then Paramount gave the world, the Godfather as a Christmas present. You know, That's so. right. exactly. <laughs> exactly. And and what's great too is, is uh that narration in the movie. I don't, I don't know if you read this part or not, but uh the narration is actually the audiobook from the 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 book. Well, that's what so I did it's funny I didn't know that, but I actually was listening to the audiobook on YouTube and I was like this is exactly the movie. I was like did they just take it from the book? The book the online the the book is 6 hours long so obviously they didn't you know use the whole thing but no uh, it's it's been edited and and uh the the audiobook is different from the book. I I don't think by varying I I don't think they vary wildly but you get a guy like Robert Evans there to tell the story. Exactly. He's <laughs> He's going to tell the story with some razzmatazz when he's gone in to do the audio book that's not on the page that he's supposed to be reading. So apparently the <laughs> audio book is better than the actual book. I have both. I couldn't tell you what's different because I read the book, God, ages, ages and ages ago, around when I discovered the movie. I saw the movie first. Um, and I also, I saw it in the theater going in, knowing who Robert Evans was in terms of seeing his name in the production credits yeah. of you know Chinatown, everything, and, <laughs> exactly. yeah, the getaway, and uh, uh, even Popeye. He, he produced Popeye. The aud- audio book is a lot of fun, and these filmmakers just kind of cut up the audio. Now it was done with Evans' participation because they have some. They they shot some new footage of him in his house, and there's a whole story about how he exactly. got to keep his house to begin with. House that exactly sort of bookends the film exactly. Yeah, so they went in and got new stuff, and and Evans is in on this. This wasn't unauthorized. This wasn't uh, this wasn't a creative cheat. It was actually really brilliant uh, that they took the audio book and rather than have him go back at his older age and narrate what is essentially going to come out as a ripoff of his own book. Uh, they named yep. the the mo- the documentary after the book, and yep. they used the audio book as the as the narration, and it's hysterical. He's such a Hollywood character. Yeah, everyone should see that at, at least once if you're interested in Hollywood history. That's right. I agreed. So for for my next film, um, I actually am going to uh, go a little further ahead into the '80s. I don't know if I would have. Uh, I'm just going to be as white as possible here. I I don't know that I would have necessarily thought of this film immediately. Had I not just seen do the right thing uh, the last time that we did a podcast, but it almost instantly sprang to my mind uh, when, when we decided to do this and that's Hollywood shuffle. Uh, It used to be talked about uh, on its face. It used to be talked about because of, of the themes that the story represents, but also behind the scenes, people talked about its director, Robert Townsend and how he essentially 
uh, was able to finance this movie by maxing out his credit cards. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if he was the first to do this, but he was maybe the first to use it as publicity for, yeah. for getting the film known. Uh, he'd already been an actor for a couple of years, but it, it is the Hollywood story from the black perspective. And uh, have you seen Hollywood Shuffle before? Yeah, because I like it, but I don't love it sort of scenario. But I also think like I haven't seen them in 20 plus years and probably would like to revisit it. Um, but I, I it's sort of like at the time of Hollywood Shuffle, there was like this sort of, you know, like the emergence of, or this sort of golden age of American independent films. And these people sort of like the fucking Quentin Tarantino's and the fucking Kevin Smith's and the, there was just this whole thing going on at the time. So this vibe or whatever of like independent film. And I thought it was fine. I don't, I, again, I haven't seen it probably since the early two thousands, maybe, maybe the late nineties or whatever, but, um, but yeah, well, why don't you talk about it instead of listening to me? Sort of... <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, <laughs> Jesus uh, Christ. Uh, rest in peace, Paul Mooney, who's credited in this film as Mr. Paul Mooney. If you watch sitcoms in the 70s and 80s, you watched Paul, Paul Mooney's work. And of course, he was a big part of uh, Chappelle's show. Also, speaking of, of television from, from an earlier era, this was also uh, co-written with Keenan Ivory Wayans just before In Living Color. Everything involving In Living Color was so big just a couple of years later. Uh, and everything involving the the Wayans brothers. Yeah, you had Keenan was in the uh, was in this and wrote it. Damon is in it at multiple points. Uh, Kim is in it at multiple points. Um, it it also features uh, Rusty Kunduf, who would later go on to do Fear of a Black Hat, which I think yeah. was a technically better film than this, but it's more uh, lampooning the music industry, than the industry. film industry. Yeah. Uh, it kind of is the uh, the hip hop equivalent of this is Spinal Tap, uh, and then he also uh, Rusty Kundiff was the co creator of the Tales from the Hood series, which is still I won't say going strong, but it's still going. It's um, still going. Yeah, uh, but the the first one I I remember enjoying quite a bit. The um, the crux of Hollywood Shuffle it's really about Robert Townsend essentially playing himself, maybe a couple of steps lower in the ladder than he was when he finally got this produced. Um, took him two years. Um, but he um, he's a black actor trying to get uh, a foothold to make a living. And every role that he's offered is either some sort of a gangbanger or a drug addict or a servant like a butler or some kind of a slave. And uh, his reaction to this is as he's going about this movie, trying to get cast in this other movie where he would be playing a thug again, he's imagining himself in these other scenarios where he kind of goes mentally into these sketches much like uhf did a couple years later where it, there's a legitimate story behind like as as the spine of this thing with several sketches attached along the way sketches of of uh, a black acting school for for example in which they teach you how to behave like a slave and things like that and yeah. it's really biting and i i read reviews uh, that came out uh, at the time in 1987 when this film came out. And uh, even then they were saying, you know, some of the things that he's calling out as stereotypes are a little stale now, and maybe we've already moved beyond that. But when you consider that he was writing this for several years, uh, not to mention, I, I think it came back around to that. Um, I mean, black characters being used as, as servants just a couple years later, uh, driving Miss Daisy wins best picture. Uh, you know, so these things do keep on coming around and, and thank God we're finally getting out of that mold. Uh, it, it's taken a lot of work. There's been a lot yeah. of movies that have, that have bucked that just not enough of them to have turned it into the culture rather than, than the counterculture. And so I think that Hollywood shuffle does a good job of representing that part of Hollywood culture. Um, and it's, uh, the, the struggle that anybody faces trying to make it in a creative business. Uh, but the, the added impact of, of always having to, at least in his case, in this film, belittle yourself and your entire culture to play a role in order to get paid and, and do the thing that you supposedly love to do. To do yeah. What impressed me with Hollywood shuffle is that there's enough of it that is still relevant here over 30 years later that that it's worth seeing again and and one of the things that's interesting about hollywood shuffle there there are lots of movies where someone's tr fighting to get a role in something and them getting the role in it would be the happy ending uh whereas hollywood shuffle he gets the part he keeps on auditioning for this role as 
some sort of like a pimp. And when he gets the role, he's still faced with the question of, did he win? Like, is it the right thing to take the role? You know, he, he's going to be able to pay some bills, but his grandma's going to be ashamed of him. Um, and, and that's something that I yeah. don't think that you ever see. Like every other story, getting the role is the end of the story. Yeah. For this, getting the role was like the beginning of act three. And now accepting the role now that it's been won becomes the issue. And, and, and of course, it ends quite famously with him, with Robert Townsend as Black Superman, uh, which is uh, worthy of pointing out that um, now here we are. Decades and decades later, finally just beginning to even discuss the concept of the idea that there could be a black Superman uh, cinematically, which just shows the, that that's not a marker for how far we've come. That That is, uh, it, it took a little long to get here yeah. from there. Um, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's, and it's, it, it's something that's going to be relevant probably, you know, unfortunately, it's a journey that's nowhere near its conclusion. I don't think like that's still, yeah. there's still have a lot of progression to be made in that subject. And, and that's the thing is when you're talking about films about Hollywood experience and dealing with Hollywood, like there's a lot of things that, you know, lots of films have touched upon whether, you know, the, uh, you know, the inherent uh, greediness of Hollywood and, you know, spitting up and, che- you know, chewing up and spitting out talent. But that specific story that Charlie Shuffle does is, it's rare. We don't get to see that perspective often and, and the ramifications of, as you said, sort of, you know, you want to be an actor, but the roles that you're getting aren't responsible to the, you know, it, yeah, it's just a fascinating and very unique perspective and story that, as we said, there's probably way more that could be, you know, even, you know, an earth in that topic and really, you know, delved into, but you know, it's just Hollywood Shuffle sort of stands as a unique film about the experience and it's sort of it's it's sort of alone on that flagpole sort of flying it you know all by itself so pretty fascinating um and i i do now feel like i'm gonna have to rewatch it just because you know um even sure. as you were taught mm-hmm. i was just gonna say i'm pretty sure i saw it on tubi everything is on tubi everything is on tubi <laughs> I, I swear to god like any weird obscure 80s horror movie that i'm looking for always ends up being on tubi god bless tubi um but yeah, that's that's awesome. I feel like that was a really interesting choice because, again, like you said, maybe not the first one that would come to most people's minds because, I mean, there's a lot that you can say about that specifically, but um, such a unique perspective. Um, and again, a comedy, but based in a lot of like, you know, very hard, you know, uncomfortable truths. So uh, I think it was a good choice. Again, like I said, we we could really get into that topic, I think, more on, on a future episode, but uh, we'll, we'll save it for later. Very quickly on the next one, um, probably my, the term schaden, schadenfreude sort of, I don't think I have been as ups, my feelings about this film are very strong. The next one I'm <laughs> going to talk about is Overnight, uh, a documentary about the filmmaker Troy Duffy, the director of the, for some reason, cult classic uh, film, <laughs> Boondock Saints, um, and basically about how he shot himself in the foot and in this unprecedented deal made in Hollywood, basically dream scenario and how it all sort of fucking fell apart because of who he was as a person. Let me start by saying I had an ex-girlfriend who I hadn't seen Boondock, Boondock Saints yet at this point. It was still had, had come out on home video pretty recently. And I had an ex-girlfriend at the time who was like, oh, you're going to love this movie. It's better than Reservoir Dogs. Which is one weird because I don't ever remember telling her I was a huge Reservoir Dogs fan in the first place. <laughs> uh, wasn't you know I I don't ever remember being that guy, but uh, you know and I like Reservoir Dogs and I like Reservoir Dogs I I like Reservoir Dogs enough at the time. I mean it was the first fucking movie where they talked about uh, you know the thing from um, the Fantastic Four. Uh, any sort of movie referencing comic book culture always sort of got on my attention. But I remember in our little group of friends you know, we, we were Tarantino fans and I liked Reservoir Dogs, but again, it wasn't, I remember at this point, I don't ever remember, but she, but she also made this bold claim, which I will also say, no, it wasn't, but I knew, I ended up watching it and I knew 20 minutes into watching this movie, into watching Blue Doc Saints, that whoever was responsible for this fucking movie I, I hate this person. I knew that <laughs> 20 minutes into Boondock Saints. I was like, this is the most hateable fucking, anyways. Uh, so obviously when the film Overnight came out and I heard what it was about, I, I watched, I, 
soon as I could get my dirty little hands on it, I watched this movie. And it is one of the most fascinating. Uh, it's like 120 minutes, a pretty short little documentary filmed as basically it was two friends of the of Troy Duffy, two guys that basically worked for him. They were like his friends, but they were also like sort of managing his shitty ass band. And also he was basically telling them like uh, he was basically putting all this his quote unquote friends to work at that point for him and like basically promising them the moon and saying we're all going to be rich and famous. Meanwhile, that's you know not at all what the reality of the situation was. But so there, it started off as basically a documentary sort of celebrating this amazing thing that happened where he was sort of discovered by um, fucking Harvey Weinstein, which we'll, we'll touch upon that more in a second. But yeah, uh, Harvey Weinstein sort of discovered him and basically ended up buying him the bar he worked at, bought him a bar, promised him a record deal and a fucking, you know, a film career. And the film sort of starts off in this sort of like celebrating this moment. Uh, and then, you know, unintendedly sort of then becomes this sort of scathing documentary about what really ended up happening, you know, in real time throughout the movie's, you know, progression of Troy Duffy basically being a piece of shit human being who pisses off everybody in Hollywood is arrogance and his fucking hubris way out of control and basically ends up having everything sort of fall apart, ends up having to make his movie for a much smaller budget, you know, and it never gets distributed. It's, it's a weird interest. Like it's still, a, it's a documentary, but it's still a film. And, you know, most films are edited to have a protagonist and an antagonist in some form or another um, in some way, you know, in some conceivable way. This is an interesting documentary because it actually has two villains because Troy Duffy is the villain. He is, you know, at no point is this a likable human being. But then also Harvey Weinstein is the villain because which Harvey Weinstein was a villain, you know, when this movie came out, reality has proven he is a much bigger, more despicable villain as we've come to find out. In fact, that's how much I hate Troy Duffy is I found myself sort of rooting for Harvey Weinstein throughout watching this movie, <laughs> rewatching it for like the, you know, you know, being like, yeah, th thanks Harvey for fucking this guy. And like, oh, wait, wait. I don't want to. I don't want to support Harvey Weinstein in any way, but he, Troy Duffy, first off, you, God, I, I really wish somehow this podcast would get into Troy Duffy's hands. Uh, Cause I, I don't think I ever see an occasion where I could actually say this to his face, but first off, dude, your shitty ass band, the brood, um, dude, your brother's wearing a bowler hat. You're wearing fucking leather trench coats, holding Rottweilers. You were the, this was the corn. That band was not, Knowing that his shitty band sold 690 copies of their album fills me with so much joy. Uh, what doesn't fill me with joy, though, is the fact that the film does has found an audience that I, there are people who love Boondock Saints. Boondock Saints is encapsulates everything I hate about a certain demographic of Americans. These sort of Americanized I, people that sort of are way too proud of their Irish heritage. Um, they think that their Irish heritage somehow makes them badasses or or ultimately it's the very thinly veiled racism that encapsulates a certain, not, not every Irish American person is this way. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying as somebody who is from Boston, Massachusetts, I can verify that there's a segment of very over, overly enthusiastically proud Irish Americans uh, who are also very racist, homophobic. They're just, they encapsulate like the worst part of humanity. And they just inevitably all think like trench coats, leather trench coats and uh, goatees and fucking bowler hats apparently are like the height of badassery. And I just hate those people. Anyways, weird tangent, but uh, <laughs> uh, still based in all truth. You know, at one point, like this is a dude that is caught on film sort of kind of sexually assaulting a drunk girl. Um, he uses the term uh, Jewish as a like offensive, you know, sort of stereotypical, uh, you know, cheap or whatever. He He's just accuses a real people of being Jewish. Like, I know that's the thing. Anybody who can accuse somebody yeah. of being yeah. Jewish, that's 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 a bad egg. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's unfortunate because like the Boonock Saints has like, you know, Billy Connolly's great in it. Um, I, I still don't think the Willem Dafoe performance is as genius as ever. And I love Willem Dafoe. I love Willem Dafoe. I don't think his performance is in that movie. I, I think a bet like that same performance with a better writer and director could have been in better performance, but I give him credit. Like, you know, it's, it's a very interesting choice the way that, that his character is portrayed. The, the Defoe character, like, okay, we're going to need a badass to come in and stop our boys, but who eventually is going to, you know, like our boys because, well, geez, I'm the police. Well, and these guys are doing my job for me. Maybe I should be on their side. 
that's kind of the attitude he takes but there's a part of me that just i can hear in his head like what can i do to make this guy even more extreme i know i'll make him gay which i'm sure gay was not the term that he was using in his head by the way um i I, i'm sure he was using a different term that started with an f i agree and (laughs) and somehow thought that that was the wrinkle that was going to make defoe's character interesting uh but then like has somebody who might defy stereotypes by the second half of the movie is now in drag and now like completely yep. humiliating the subgroup of people who might have been cheering on that role so yeah it, yeah, it was right. it's such a piece of shit movie so it's so it's not a single ended. thought it's, connected yeah. <laughs> exactly and the thing is like even bad like you can empathize with you know bad people because everybody's human but it no and it, it's it, of course it's edited you know as anything the real power of film lies in the editing you know you can edit anybody to seem like a like a good person or a bad person if you choose to only you know what i'm saying like but at the same time this is a guy throughout the whole film is very much consistent with his i mean he's just a fucking uh, egomaniac he's a narcissist he's abusive he's a liar he's just he's always talking like talking about like there's it's so fucking embarrassing watching this movie just watching this guy pontificate and just like basically just like oh i i deserve everything because i'm a genius and you know it's it's so but it's so delicious because i hate this guy so much i hated him before i knew he existed like just watching (laughs) boonock saying i was like this guy this voice because this the the film is a very strong voice i will give it that it definitely has some sort of like creative point of view it's just a point of view i can't stand and i knew that and then just watching this guy i'm like this is exactly who I thought it was. So watching that guy sort of just fall apart and like have every, like lose everything because he's such a piece of shit. But it, but the thing is that it also makes it so fascinating is to say, first off, again, this is a period in history that we'll never see again, where it's just sort of like where there was Hollywood was still going after these sort of, and, and maybe we'll see it again, but I don't see it happening anytime soon where, you know, currently Hollywood is all about big tentpole movies, you know, big superhero franchises, remakes, sequels, prequels everything you know this was a time in Hollywood history where like a young new voice an exciting new voice an original point of view Hollywood's trying to like capitalize that because of the success of that guys like Tarantino and Kevin Smith to a degree so you know this was a period in time that's fascinating because this was a time when you know just some Joe Schmo bartender guy could get like a film career and it was also fascinating because we really get to see like the ins and outs of dealing with distribution issues dealing with the way that like you know if you piss off one person in hollywood you could fuck yourself up forever and so for that reason alone it's fascinating but for me specifically personally it is one of the most rewarding films because i'm i and it's terrible i should not i should not celebrate somebody else's failure but man do i and uh i I, it's it's like it's like a warm bath or a nice bowl of ice cream i just i eat it up because i I just love watching that fucking dude just lose everything because i i mean i guess i'm not I, I, maybe i'm also a villain but i guess i'm comfortable <laughs> with it in this moment well you're not wrong um i i actually i have a connection to this film because i was i was there at the premiere it premiered at the film forum in new york city where i was working at the time and the the two guys who directed it who were the uh the two guys tasked with being docu personal documentarians for troy duffy they were there and were able to to tell even more of the horrendous story. Um, and, and also we found out uh, because we asked them, um, does Troy Duffy know this movie exists yet? And apparently he didn't, he found out when it came out, um, which is a nice little, <laughs> I love it. Um, but, but we were curious, I think, cause part of us wanted to know, like, do we need to watch out for this guy? Cause we're showing his movie. Is he going to come in here and throw a fit? Please let him come in here and throw a fit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I want to see this happen in real time because um, there's nothing he can do to us. Um, of course not. But uh, yeah, they had something like 400 hours worth of footage that they edited down into this uh, 80 some odd minute documentary. And I, I agree. There's something at Robert Evans of all people. It, it's uh, the quote that starts the kid stays in the picture. There are three sides to every story. Your side, my side, and the truth, truth. and not, and none of us are lying. So there, there are nuances, and I know that out of the three, four hundred hours worth of footage they had, they had the filming of the movie, and and he seemed to actually be on a 
creative high on the set of the movie. So they probably could have made a movie that was positive about him, about the actual production uh, and and skipping all the the pre-production nightmares. But here's the thing. Troy Duffy gave them no reason to see him, see them in, in that light. Someone who could do this, some, this thing to people in his influence and to, to think that he could treat the world the way that he tried to treat the world, let alone yep. the movie industry, let alone Harvey Weinstein at the peak of his powers. Yep. Um, yep. You know, there's a scene where Troy Duffy at the end is speaking to a film school and he is so just rambling and calling them out on what he perceives as the film school bullshit. Yep. Someone who could just do that, that one act, ignore the rest of everything else. That one thing proves to me that the rest of the movie is the truth. The rest of the movie is showing yep. the real story and not the happy spots of the 400 hours that he filmed, of which I'm sure there was lots. Um, I, I think maybe it got a little sleazy in showing some of the bandmates being womanizing behind the scenes when they were drunk. And I, I think that there were colla- there was collateral damage to Troy Duffy's breakdown. And I think his bandmates were part of it, but I can't imagine the level of really like PTSD levels of FOMO of watching his meteoric rise and being part of his band or being one of his bros, you know? Nobody wants to walk away because this guy does seem to be pulling it back together and getting his movie made and getting the album deal and and all of this. So I feel bad for everybody that's connected to him. Uh, And and I do think that just being in this person's hubris can create negative behavior in the people around him. And I feel like maybe some of the bandmates deserve better than the treatment in the film. But uh, first off, I I will say this, though. First off, if you're a piece of shit, like if you're trying to pull down drunk girl shirts and shit and it's calling video, fuck you. You you're a scumbag who I mean, uh, to me, it like and like in the uh, point, I don't point know if it's his man. <laughs> you, you're right. You're right. It's been a little while since I've seen the film. I forgot it was that I aggressive. Mean, I'm thinking that it was in my head. I'm thinking they're just kind of slobbering over each other. I mean, there, there's there's all that. I mean, there is a ton of that. And they're talking very crude about women and stuff. But. Um, at one point, like his producer, which maybe this is a little sleazy, but like the t- I don't know if it's his producer is his his um, Troy's manager, some tall dorky guy in glasses. Like one scene, he's like with his his he's basically drunk on camera, saying like, "Oh, I live with this. My girlfriend supports me. You know, I love her. She like she pays for everything." And then the very next clip is him trying to fuck with this sleep with this other girl at the bar, and like she's like, <laughs> and I was like, uh, and I'm like, yeah, that's a little. That point is a little like sleazy but also fuck yeah like anybody anybody who is pulled into that dude's orbit the only people i i feel bad for are his fucking family and especially his poor brother who like is the guy who's like you know just trying to like hey man i just want my band to work and he's like i think that's you know, what it is i think it's the brother i think when i say yeah. that i feel bad for the bandmates what i mean is i feel bad for duffy's brother who is very clearly the talented one in the family the brother. yeah <laughs> uh and and is getting shit that's on right. this whole time and just he and and that's the thing that's so you know there's a sequence when he's in the car with his mom and like she's basically telling like he's basically saying like fucking talking shit about his brother and basically saying his brother is like he's like his biggest regret is that i'm his uh older brother because he wants to be me and fuck him and he's gonna blow it like and he's just so like there's such a cruelty in his voice and basically he's so arrogant that I'm like, this one thing, just this one clip, that's all I need to know that this guy is a piece of shit. Like no decent human being would have that kind of conversation with this. Like, look, I know family yeah. dynamics are crazy, but this, that is not even remotely healthy, like, you know, understandable or normal behavior. Or conversation. Like, only a true egomaniac, a truth like fucking sociopath has that sort of point of view, but either way, um, I, I think it, was, it, was, second- it was sociopath meets alcoholism meets Harvey Weinstein and Harvey Weinstein was not well, the, yeah. Harvey Weinstein fucked with this dude and Harvey Weinstein yeah. never should have been in business with this dude to begin with. Even if we didn't know what we know about Duffy. Um, I, I did research some stuff on what Duffy has done since. Cause all I knew was that he, over a decade later, finally did Boondock Saints Sequel. two, and now over a decade later, he's promising to do Boondock Saints three. So clearly, he's 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 got one note, and he keeps on trying to hit it. Yeah. Um, I did hear his story though of what 
he perceived Harvey Weinstein had done to him. And he was actually pretty right on about it. Harvey Weinstein was fucking with him. Um, it doesn't make Troy Duffy a good person that Harvey Weinstein no. was fucking with him. Harvey Again, Weinstein is a piece villain. of shit. That, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I was listening to see if maybe I could find some sort of humanity in Duffy nowadays in listening to more modern interviews. There's a whole two hour long podcast from last month where he finally addresses the topic of overnight. Um, and his, his statement, let's see, I, I have it written down by quote. This is what Troy Duffy says about overnight bored shitless. I mean, I was there. I know what happened as if the movie was made just for him. I don't know what exactly. Like. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure that Jesus is exactly who that guy is. <laughs> and then I also wrote down because I just thought this was funny. He was talking about directors that he likes. He's a, for one thing, he's been Christ. called Tarantino for dummies, which I think is a pretty accurate way to describe Boondock Saints. And he was talking about director Joe Carnahan, who is his movies are more known than than him. He did stuff like Smoke and Aces, Narc, Boss Level very recently. Um, yeah. But he, he's talking about Joe Carnahan and yep. Troy Duffy gets real excited and he goes, that dude is the John Wayne of film. And all I could think was like, my God, man, John Wayne was the John Wayne of film. What the fuck? Like, what? how many drinks did you have before you went to this interview? <laughs> like... <laughs> Dude, that's wow. But yeah, now he's we the know Beatles who the of music. <laughs> Dude, he's the Lennon of those glasses, man. He's... So stupid. <laughs> Dude, uh, Sorry, I, th- I thought you would appreciate that. Says that says everything you need to know about that dude. <laughs> that's amazing. There, in one point in the movie, which he's like at the very beginning of the movie, he's basically like talking shit about, you know, at one point he basically says, like, oh, like Ethan Hawk sucks or whatever. And I was like, dude, Ethan Hawke is like, he's a great actor. He's like a, actually a good writer. I'm like, <laughs> what the, what a bunch of pontificating try hard bullshit. Like of all the, like, and again, you know, at the time he was like a young, but I'm like that, that like right there, I was like, dude, you don't know shit about film. You don't like, you suck. Like, I, it, I don't know why I got so offended by it, but I was just like, dude, give me a break. <laughs> because this guy doesn't really know what he's doing. No, he's, he has, he has no clue. But yeah, I mean, he's just, I mean, he's such a clown and he deserves everything he gets. And he's like, he is, he is so exactly, he, he's so perfectly American in his arrogance and his, <laughs> uh, his unwarranted belief in self. But I mean, the thing is, though, uh, I, I, I at least give him props because the one positive thing I can say about Troy Duffy and especially Troy Duffy in that movie, in this documentary, is that he believes in himself and he also is like, he really wants his dreams to come true and he fights for his dreams. Like he doesn't just like let, you know, he's not going to get steamrolled or whatever. Like he's, you know, as somebody who has, you know, doesn't really have a pot to piss and has no real, like, uh, you know, where a lot of people in his shoes would like sort of kowtow to Hollywood or sort of bend over and spread the cheeks. You know, he, he sort of stands up for himself, but he's so abusive and he's such a fucking arrogant piece of shit that, you know, even that I can't even re- really root for that because the way he talks to people, the way he talks down to people. But man, again, it's the definition of Schadenfreude for me because I shouldn't revel so much in his failure, but I do. <laughs> well, my final movie uh, is in a sort of nod to our unofficial year anniversary is Boogie Nights, which I, I picked because uh, maybe it's not the filmmaking that people think about when they think of movies about filmmaking uh, <laughs> uh but boogie nights is a masterpiece and it really is aside from the fact that it's a melodrama about this group of people it, it really there is a lot of stuff on set there's a lot of cameras being used and a lot of the filmmaking process is, is displayed in it and i i truly think that this this film takes place specifically at the time when pornography could have become never mainstream legitimate. but could have become legitimate cinema exactly I, I i have not studied pornography um at least not in the historical sense uh but <laughs> <laughs> but i have studied exploitation films and the venn diagram for exploitation films and pornography definitely overlaps pretty considerably 
Um, so you, you learn certain things about certain producers, certain actors, certain markets, and you're, you're going to get a little bit of this. And, and not to mention there was, there was some mainstream stuff. Uh, well, maybe not mainstream stuff. I'll take that back. Uh, there, there was some legitimate art house stuff um, where we know for a fact that the actors were having sex on camera. We just weren't getting the pornographic oh, yeah. angle. We weren't getting the money shot or anything like that. Um, but, but Chris Christopherson has admitted to, to having had sex in, in his movies. I was watching one uh, the other day, almost included on this list called The Last Movie by Dennis Hopper, which is really the movie that brought Dennis yep. Hopper down, Troy Duffy style. Hopper was was nuts making that. And there's a scene where he's having sex with a lady under a waterfall. And you can tell that there was not a stunt double used. Um, so, so this type of filmmaking was starting to, in the late 70s, um, and a little earlier than that, was starting to, to become part of the independent movement. And uh, I, I think what happened with the advent and the popularization of home video and all of this stuff that destroyed the uh, artistic pornographic world it was also the stuff that, thank God, saved us from uh, having to deal with too many sex scenes that were actual sex scenes uh, in, in our regular movies. Um, but the fact that the, the popularization of videotape plays such a part in the storyline of boogie nights is why i still consider it a filmmaking uh, a movie about filmmaking um because aside from just the cheeky side of that there really was a legitimate period of time where things could have gone some different directions and of course burt reynolds is the director in boogie nights uh, the the great jack horner and he's uh he's an amalgam of of several other actual pornographic directors tarantino has famously uh thrown up a beef with this, with reynolds character because he knows who uh reynolds character is based on that uh, doesn't know him personally i don't think although he may have tarantino used to work at the pussycat um yeah. but uh he claims that the director that Jack Horner is based on never would have directed as bad of a movie as the one that they make in Boogie Nights. And, and I have to agree, but I think I lean on the PT Anderson side of this argument because the film itself is not as fun. If you're more accurate that way, that movie, the Dirk Diggler starring uh, yeah. buddy detective movie that they all made together. It needed to be bad. It needed to be awful to, to really kind yeah. of make uh, certain other elements of the movie uh, work. But, yeah, but my God, what a cast! What a soundtrack! What a visual style! Yes, on the face of it, it's a movie about the pornography industry, but it's also very clearly on its face a a, a movie about alternative family the the families that you create amongst your exactly. friends and your coworkers, yep. the people who you lean on when you can't lean on your parents, when you the, the people who are in on your every day in ways that your otherwise uh, mentors and other authority figures wouldn't be in on uh, these people lean on each other. And Burt Reynolds as Jack Horner is the, the patriarch of all of that. And, and uh, Julianne Moore is the mother of all. And uh, I remember seeing this in the theater in 97 and just being blown away. Cause I showed up to see a movie starring Burt Reynolds about the seventies porn scene, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't expect to walk away feeling moved. You know, That's I didn't, right. I didn't expect to like actually cry at this one. And I did, it made me cry. Uh, yep. Not necessarily the hardest thing in the world for a movie to do for me, but same, same. <laughs> uh, but that movie has stayed with me since it came out uh, as one of the movies I wish that I had made, because I think that it captures that love of cinema in a very alternative way. It has that incredible subtext. It has, one of the perfect casts of all time. Absolutely. Uh, you you may have been in the theater with us when I when I saw that for the first time. I can't remember. I I I I know I saw it on opening weekend. I know we. I was with a big group of people. I know we all loved it. So okay, uh, yeah. I probably was with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure we were. We just weren't sitting together. Uh, but yeah, that <laughs> back then we used to uh, walk up to the uh, box office and say, yes, I'd like 20 for Boogie Nights, please. That's and, right. For and, real. Yeah. No, somehow we, we made this that. work. I don't. Yeah. God, those are good days. But yep. uh, but yeah, that what, what are your thoughts on on Boogie Nights? Uh, in particular, uh, what are your thoughts on the the film elements of Boogie Nights? Well, first of everything you said, I 
agree wholeheartedly. I think first off, it was a film that sort of launched a bunch of careers. I think uh, it was a platform for a bunch of sort of uh, unknown actors at the time, the John C. Reilly's, the uh, Don, Don Cheadle's, like there was a ton of people who sort of, it was sort of their launching pad. Uh, it's one of the, like you said, it's one of the greatest casts, one of the most brilliant films in how it approached its subject matter, what it had to say, how it balanced comedy with a lot of heart, like a lot of heart about a subject you wouldn't normally associate with that. Um, but as a film, like there's a specific sequence, which I think you were, you'd even referenced as far as where, you know, these producers are coming to Jack Horner to basically try to convince him to go to video. And he has this whole thing, like, I'll never do video. And it, I remember being in the theater being like, wow, yeah, that's, I never thought about that, but how that really does like, as a filmmaker is like, you still, if you still consider yourself an artist and the changing of format and then like, you know, uh, that inevitable, either you have to sort of get on board and, uh, or get out of the way, but you know, change is coming, progress is happens. And like, uh, you know, how like something like that, it's more efficient, more cost efficient, but how it actually changes an art form. There's a lot of concepts in that scene outside of like cocaine and all other sort of crazy shit happening in that around that same sequence. But I just remember being like fascinated in that point because there's a point of view I never thought about before. Um, and it's re very relevant to this day with a changing of, I mean, whole large topic, but like, you know, how there's people who think that like film should only be shot in film and digital is trash. There's people now who making movies on their fucking cell phones. There's whole fucking film festivals for film shot on cell phones and stuff. So, I mean, it's just, these things are constantly happening and, you know, culturally there's going to be people impacted by those changes and, and, and things like, you know, progress and technology and stuff. It was just fascinating. Not where I would have expected from my, my pseudo John Holmes biopic movie, you know, like it's just not, you know, those big picture stuff, but it, I mean, it's one of the greatest, I, I think, I mean, it's definitely better than heart eight, but heart eight was great too, but it's such an accomplishment from a fucking, such a young director. Paul Thomas Anderson was uh, like a baby. What, he was like 25 or 20. He was a, he was a baby when he made that movie. It's embarrassing it's to me personally how young he was when he made something yep. that good with people in it that I would die to work with. 100% <laughs> legitimate. I, I know. And I mean, the thing of it, and it's still, I, I think the thing that I get most upset about to this day is the fact that, you know, I, you and I have talked about it, I think multiple times, but of all the movies for Burt Reynolds to be, to hate, of all the performances for him to be mad at, that's the one you choose to be mad at? Like, your best perform, like, the, oh God, do the whole, the, I, he's so good in it, and he's such a real human being, and he has such heart, and such, like, there's such, he, he's such a three-dimensional person in that movie, in this sort of cartoonish, stylish porn film, like, but He's so real in it. It makes me so upset that he can't appreciate or that he didn't appreciate how brilliant that, uh, you know, I don't know. Anyways. Couldn't agree with you more. Now uh, we, we're down to the, the finale here. This is, I, I, I happen to know what it's going to be. So I'm very excited to talk about this movie, but why don't you go ahead and tell us what this, the last movie we're going to talk so, about. Is. So my last movie detailing uh, a real Hollywood story is uh, Ed Wood. Uh, which I still to this day hold as Tim Burton's masterpiece. I remember very foolishly at the time thinking that this was Tim Burton reaching a new level of both artistic achievement as well as a sort of like critical achievement. Boy, was I wrong. Um, <laughs> the movie flopped hard. Uh, it, it, I mean, it was critically acclaimed, but it, it flopped hard, made no money. Uh, and then he went on to make a bunch of shitty cash and movies uh, afterwards. But um it is a, literally for me a perfect movie, uh, and, and it's it's funny because it echoes so many of my same sentiments about Boogie Nights with a a cast top to bottom, a cast of amazing actors. You know, very famously, Martin Landau won the Best Supporting Actor, rightfully so, for his portrayal of fucking. I don't know how accurate it is, but a very um, hysterical version of Bela Lugosi, one of the funniest. <laughs> Even thinking about Martin Lando delivering certain lines in the movie fills me with joy and laughter. Uh, but also very others again, you know, there's a, a very true heart to the movie. People talk shit about Giant Depp. It is this movie is why I will always be a Giant Depp fan because I know what he's capable of. The character of Ed Wood, the one thing I love about so yes, it is a biopic movie, 
But unlike every other biopic movie that tries to like sort of cash in on the melodrama of of the real person's life and sort of either deify them or, you know, sort of paint them as either a tragic figure or sort of, a you know, this movie, it has so much heart, but it doesn't take itself too seriously. I mean, the script is so fucking brilliant, but Ed Wood is one of the most pure, like this, you know, I'm not going to tell I don't know the real Ed Wood. I don't know, like, I mean, his life, you know, had a lot. He's he was a very interesting character. The end of his life, you know, is kind of sad and tragic. But this version of Ed Wood is one of the most likable. Ed Wood, for a long time, sort of stood as this guy who had more ambition than he had talent, which we laugh at. But to me, I think it's sort of very heroic of somebody who wants to do something so well, and maybe he's not naturally gifted, or maybe he's maybe they don't have the you know the whatever. I mean, the advantage is there's a lot I could kind of delve into, but he makes movies because he's such a fan of movies and he loves movies so much. And I think that's heroic. I think that's great. And I think I've, I've talked about it before. I don't believe in loving things, especially film or anything artistically, ironically, I love them despite flaws or I can look past flaws to see what the intent of the film or the filmmaker was like, I don't, it's hard for me. I don't, I don't enjoy like, Oh, it's so stupid or so bad. I love it. Like while I get, I, I can, well, I can appreciate that idea, and I, I, there's probably there's an element of that to the films I love. To films I love, I I try to appreciate things for where the heart of that art, like art of any kind, has heart to it, or it should. It should have a point of view. It should have like um, something to say, of course. But I think ultimately there should be a, a real passion and desire to do it. That's why I think you know somebody like David Lynch stands above other people who make weird esoteric films just for the sake of making weird. You can tell that. David Lynch is very honest. His heart is in his movies. Like you can, he, you know, these are, he's not just trying to be weird for the sake of being weird. David Lynch is a real artist because he puts himself into his films. Ed Wood put himself into his films. He just didn't have the technical know-how to sort of make them good films or, uh, you know, he sort of, um, his taste levels maybe weren't there. But the thing is that Johnny Depp portrays Ed Wood as such an optimist, as such a, like, He's such a sweet soul and has such a huge heart in this movie. You know, sometimes he's an opportunist. He's still a human being. Sometimes he like wants to exploit his friends because he, he, he has this drive. He has a passion. He has an ambition. He wants to make the, make the movies he wants to make. But he's, he's got such a great, he's just such that endearing, like sort of, you know, sort of wide eyed, crazy smile that he does throughout the whole movie. This sort of like, almost like childlike. Be yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I just, I, I, I appreciate it so much. I love the look of the film. I love, you know, even George Amel Steel is toward Johnson and the, uh, like the Mickey Mouse. Like there's just so many, there's brilliant. Sort of, I mean, Bill Murray sort of every time he's on scene, surprisingly, he sort of steals the show, but literally everybody in the film, you know, unfortunately um, I don't want, I, I, I'm blanking on his name, but uh, the actor p- portrays Kreskin, not Kreskin, um, uh, good Lord. Jeffrey Jones playing Criswell. Criswell. Thank you. Yes. Jeffrey Jones. Uh, it's, I'm such a fan of his work. It's unfortunate that he is a monster. Uh, he is a, a pedophile, unfortunately. Um, uh, so that's unfortunate, but I've always been, I, I just, it sucks because I do really enjoy his work, but he, it's always weird because I hate, because the cast is so great, but then I get to Jeffrey Jones and I'm like, oh, that's right. But um, it's just such a great, you know, it, first off, it speaks to me like the subject matter. I love old science fiction horror movies. I do. I I actually do truly enjoy some of Edwards' films. Not all of them, but I do enjoy them. But I just love the aesthetic. The, the whole opening sequence is so perfectly shot. I feel like it boils on everything that was great about what Tim Burton had previously achieved with his aesthetic, his visual style, like his even down to like the, his soundtrack. Like, it just sort of he, everything he had done before, Edward sort of perfected and sort of like the pinnacle of what he could achieve with that. And I feel like I, that's true because everything he's done since hasn't lived up to that. Like he, Ed Wood is still the, his highest achievement artistically. But I also feel like people forget that like Edward Scissorhands was legitimately a great film that legitimately critics were like, holy shit, this is a great movie. Like he had made good movies that were very, you know, especially at the time he was making nobody, you know, he sort of invented a whole sort of 
subgenre of film, this sort of like pop goth that he's still known for to this day. But he was, they were very artistic. They were very much, you know, his own personal experience with like, you know, his views on suburbia. And there's just, you know, his films up into that were still good. But Ed Wood is just sort of, it encapsulates everything that was great about him. He worked with the the, the screenwriters, did an amazing job with the script. Um, I didn't love the Margaret Keene film as much. It's a good movie, but it does, I don't think it was as good as Ed Wood. Uh, but I remember when they, Tim Burton was attached to that Margaret Keene movie. I was like, oh, and it's by the guys that did Ed Wood. This should be amazing because I do also love Ed, Margaret Keene. And I love that aesthetic as well. That sort of 60s, 70s, like post mid-century sort of aesthetic anyways. But anyways, I'm getting off topic. But either way, what I love about this movie, though, specifically in how it relates to Hollywood, besides the fact that, again, it's based off a real filmmaker, is that it does show this sort of like it's very much exactly what you said about Boogie Nights. It's weird that they're sort of very similar to that I'm sort of, as I'm thinking about it, is that these are people that are making movies that nobody respects. Fucking, you know, the monster with the atomic brain, like all these like mad scientist movies and stuff. They're not, they're movies that, you know, nobody actually respects, but they're, Edward made like his little family of people and they all supported each other. And yeah, maybe not, they're not going to be celebrated. They're not going to get rich. Maybe the rest of the world doesn't get it, but he built himself a little family, like this little family together and they made their little movies together. And there's just something I, I don't know what it is, but there's something I relate to that anyways, but there's just so much heart to it. it, it the whole, you know, and the, the whole thing with, you know, people thought like, Oh, he was exploiting um, Bella Lugosi. Like in real life, like there's been, you know, he was exploiting people, but again, this isn't real, like the uh, movies aren't real life. So even whatever you want to say about the real relationship <coughs> that Edward had with like the Lugosi and certain people in his life, the movie itself is so beautiful. And like what it says in that, like about friendship and about ambition and, you know, and about being an artist and ha- wanting uh, to express yourself. It, it just, I don't know. It's literally one of my all time favorite movies. Uh, everybody, I mean, Martin Landau, it's funny because, you know, even the like Rick Baker, I Rick Baker actually won the, the Academy Award, I think, for it. But like, yeah, he did. You see, yeah, if you see Martin Landau in that role, you don't realize how much that was made to make him look like Bill. Martin Landau is these, you know, Bill Gosey had very thin lips. Martin Landau is big old fish lips in real life. And like, they had to like just all of the work, even artistically, in that, like, there was so much effort put in to make this movie about bad movie, this bad movie, you know, this bad filmmaker and his shitty movies. There's so much artist artistry and, and, and appreciation made like the movie is a love letter to a certain filmmaker. And even beyond that, a certain approach to filmmaking. And I, I love, I think it's one of the greatest beyond just what it says about Hollywood and all this. Stuff, it's just a movie I hold very close to my heart. So same here. I, I saw it. I remember seeing it uh, like a sneak preview a week before it came out, you know, back when they used to do that. You and I, we were both there and they gave away uh, Edward t-shirts. I think you and I were both there not knowing each other yet. Oh, you know what? No, that wasn't, we got the, maybe I, maybe it wasn't the premiere. I remember it was like a theater in Riverside. I think it was a midnight. It was the day of the, it wasn't like a sneak screening. It was premiere night, but it was like midnight, the night uh, of like, you know, Thursday to right. Friday, whatever. And, but they, I remember they gave away the an Edward t-shirt with this. I, I never wore white t-shirts, but I wore this fucking shirt to death of him in this, like the director's chair, like looking over shoulder wearing the Angora sweater. But anyways, I wore that t-shirt to death and I cherished it. But y- yeah, it wasn't at a sneak screening. It was the, the midnight premiere of it on, on release date. Cause I remember I saw it with my dad. Cause my dad was the one who showed me um, plan nine from outer space. We were at a Fangoria convention in 1993 and they were showing Plan 9. They were projecting it uh, with Vampira in attendance. So I got to meet Vampira, which is still in, in my mind, like, like holy shit. I didn't shit. know that. Yeah. So she was fucking awesome. Oh, um, <laughs> Agreed. I never got to meet her, but yes, agreed. She's amazing. But uh, yeah, I, I'll never forget seeing it with, with my dad because it was the two of us just cracking up. And we were, it was a week before the movie came out. And I was thinking, this is going to be huge. I think we were the only ones in the theater. So I, I learned pretty quickly. Uh, I was still in high school, but I learned pretty quickly. This one's not going to be a big hit. I think that made me actually love it more. I think that made me push for it. I think it made me recommend yeah. it heavier just because it is such a fun movie. And I'm glad you picked it for several reasons, but I do want to say I've been holding this in since you mentioned Chaplin. Chaplin to me coming out in 92 the style of it and, and the directing by Sir uh, Sir Richard Attenborough. Richard Attenborough, yeah. Uh, yes. I believe that that felt like the end of an era 
for biofilms um because you know attenborough also directed gandhi and you know very serious serious minded films and to me that was the end of that era that was the goodbye um it very well done that's not a put down and then ed wood came out in 94 and to me started off the new wave of what a biofilm was going to be from then on um and that spilled into uh well it became what i think of as the scott alexander larry karajowski style of biofilm uh those are the writers they did ed wood um people versus larry flint uh man on the moon about andy kaufman the uh, big guys the one that you had mentioned um they also did the tv movie uh, about uh the trial of oj simpson and they most recently um wrote the uh, latest eddie murphy film dolomite is my name which that's right. was I forgot that they got awesome. that position yeah they got that <laughs> yeah. that gig because eddie murphy was such a big fan of ed wood and when eddie murphy met with them he was quoting ed wood verbatim back to them which i would i would pay to see that alone like ed wood one man show by eddie, eddie murphy that, fuck yeah i'm in but those guys really shaped what biofilms were to become uh, after 1994 with this movie that did not make a huge splash at the box office. Obviously it was critically beloved, but yeah, it, it is the start of the, of the new style of biofilm. I think uh, even though st- certain things that aren't even necessarily structurally similar, like walk the line, or um, I think they consulted, they actually consulted on auto autofocus, which, which feels like one of theirs. Yeah. I would say that's, I would say more in line than something like Ray or walk the line, but. But, um, but even those Ray and walk the line, I, I see elements of, alexander and karajowski's style in that uh just the same as i can see for for pretty much the entire 80s i can see attenborough's approach uh to telling a true story from uh from gandhi through chaplin yeah so yeah i mean i i I still like that's the thing is like the thing i loved about ed wood specifically is that while ironically that you know uh landau ended up winning an oscar it was the thing that it so many of the biopic films tend to try to be what they, you know, what people call Oscar bait, where it's like, especially so historically, like you said, with, with Gandhi and then Chaplin, the same, where they're these very, um, you know, I mean, first off, Sir Richard Attenborough, like, you know, they, <laughs> there's a prestige to those films or whatever, but, you know, and then inevitably biopic films have gone on to sort of become like the the films that give certain actors their oscar wins and like oh he's a great actor but they've never really gotten a really great juicy role they go to do this biopic they end up with an oscar nom at least but what i loved about ed wood is first off it's a film about a dude nobody gave a shit about if they even like you know he was a joke to the five people in america who knew who ed what who ed wood was it wasn't like this dude was being celebrated especially if you think about you know being a transvestite at the time and how like that how taboo even that just that was and how weird and and stuff that was and i do and I, i actually think there's a lot there's a beauty to the way the film actually dealt with even that aspect it the does sort of, of go out of situation and yeah exactly and but you know and how he's just like you know it's like look it's not it's just you know i just it's not that weird and like you know and like but you know how he's like you know he's like he's like i don't know man the whole movie is so again as much as i love the whole cast like i said mark lando is incredible bill murray is incredible as bunny every time he shows up he's hysterical but that whole movie works because of how what a beautiful portrayal that you know could have been really either overly campy or or kind of even mean spirited to a way, um, but uh, both Tim Burton and um, uh, blanking on his name, Johnny dude, Depp. Johnny Depp. Yeah, the, there's just a, such a huge, beautiful heart that Edward. Like, there's just even, the fact that it's in black and white is is, is again, a, it's perfect. It was the perfect choice for that film. I don't think the film would have worked in color. Like, it, it, you know, neither did Tim Burton. He uh, he stormed off of uh, the project at. Um columbia pictures because they didn't want to do it in black and white and burton said you know what i'm just going to take it somewhere else then and he did yep. he made good on that god remember when burton was actually like a credible artist <laughs> i feel bad because it's not like he like he well, has I, made a few i will say this to, in his favor um first off i think we all got tired of his style before he got tired of his style so i can't blame a person for like falling on his own trademarks yeah uh, also, I think Ed Wood was Ed Wood was his own favorite of his films. And I think when he presents something like that, yes, it won Oscars and stuff, but it, it went nowhere financially. Nope. 
No. So I think there was a part of him, of Burton, that was lost in Ed Wood. He lost a little bit of his give a shit. Um, no, I agree. And that's what I'm saying. Again, exactly. And that's the thing is you could tell he put himself in that movie and then for it to be his least, his worst performing movie probably took the wind out of his sails. And he was like, look, I, I mean, I'm just going to make movies that are going to make like, I don't even fold him, honestly. I don't. And even with like the sort of cashing in on his own trademarks, whatever, even that doesn't bother me. What bothers me is that he makes movies that don't have, you know, up until then, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, you know, Edward Scissorhands. All of his movies had his own point of view. And then after Edward, he's just sort of working with other people's point of view and just putting his stamp on it. Good point. You know, and I mean, he, like, I love, I almost said Invaders from Mars. Jesus. Mars, Mars Attacks. Attack. Like, I like, I, I, yeah, yeah, I love, there are other films of his post Edward that I love and that, that I enjoy. But again, it's just nothing will ever compare. I mean, he could come out with a, a piece of brilliance in the next few years and it, as great as it could possibly be. I don't think it will ever top Edward in my mind as far as just what an achievement is. But, you know, ultimately, I think the thing to wrap it up and bring it back to the topic at hand, I think the fact that he celebrated a filmmaker whose films were, you know, for the longest time considered the, which I don't, I've seen worse movies than fucking Plan 9 from Outer Space. I, I mean, most of what suffered his movies suffer from is just having no budget and working with amateurs. But like, I've seen movies that had a bigger budget and had, could have been better and were worse. So for that reason, but, but the fact that it's a movie that celebrates this sort of this icon of bad, of, of an ineptitude of being a joke, the fact that he makes this beautiful movie, that's a tribute to this filmmaker. And it, 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 in it itself, it doesn't, isn't commercially successful. There's a weird poetry there that at least, you know, knowing that like, yes, it, the, the, the audience didn't get it maybe, or like, it didn't make a ton of money, but it was, you know, his most successful uh, artistically. And the fact that he, there's a beauty there that I sort of can live with. You know, normally I'd be bitter that a movie that good didn't get its due, that it's not as popular, wasn't as successful. But just knowing it's a, it's a tribute to Ed Wood. And I don't know, there's a, there's just a beauty there that I can sort of live with. Yes. And, and I think, again, I give a lot of that credit, obviously to Burton and Depp, but uh, to Scott Alexander and Larry Karajowski, yes. I, I've, I've, read up on this subject i've actually if you ever want to uh an ed wood 1.5 sort of experience uh read the full first draft script of ed wood so you'll get some extra scenes that that were never made uh, including a dinner at tor johnson's house with his family family which, yeah which is yep. amazing i wish I, I hope that it's at least filmed somewhere and it will be discovered i thought um, that was filmed was thought- it maybe it's a special feature on one of the discs or maybe. something but i've i know it's in the script i've read it there's a whole other marriage in between. There's some good material in the script that didn't make it on into the final cut of the movie. Uh, but my point in bringing it up one one last time here is that I want to point out, and they do the same thing with Rudy Ray Moore in Dolomite Is My Name. They take someone who in many ways might see be seen as one of the losers of cinema and they tell their hero story. They, yeah. they cannot... No, no matter how bad Plan 9 comes out and and what we know about Plan 9 going into the theater, we're not going to see Ed Wood fail at making Plan 9. We're going to see him succeed at making Plan 9 from outer space. And that perspective on it, that approach to it, it might be a little bit more style over truth, but it is the heart of what makes that movie magical. Absolutely. I, yeah, it's a brilliant script and that that's the thing is, it's when you when Burton works with that kind of quality material, I think that's really that combination is where that magic happened. Uh, it's funny. Cause I, I really went back and forth with uh, my name is Dolomite with putting this on this list, but I didn't for two reasons. One is because I feel like if anybody's going to talk about, should talk about that movie, it's you being the foremost expert uh, of Rudy Ray Moore's catalog uh, that I personally am aware of. And I feel like at some point we will probably either get to a full black exploitation episode or just even a, a, a Rudy Ray Moore episode. And then the other reason I didn't, because it was just me be talking about how underused Wesley Snipes was in that movie and how Wesley Snipes yes. stole every fucking scene he was in. Wesley Snipes was fantastic. Yeah, just out of the blue, all of a sudden I'm like, wait, wait it, and like, I forgot ready? how good Wesley Snipes is. I'm like, ready for the like the the Snipes assaults or something. I don't know. Like, exactly. Uh, if Wesley Snipes can come back in roles like that instead of doing something like Passenger 58 or something. I will say, though, I do love I just was 
I just rewatched a couple of months ago, Passenger Fifty Seven. I was like, dude, this is a great ass action movie. It uh, is. It is. It, I'm not. I'm not saying anything against Passenger Fifty Seven. No, yeah. Like um, I know what you meant. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I think Snipes see, uh, is in a very prime spot to reinvent himself somewhat, and I that uh, Dolomite is my name was the perfect beginning point for that. I agree. You know, this was a really interesting. Besides the fact that this was supposed to be one of our short episodes. Haha. <laughs> ha. Um, I'll edit it down for, for our listeners. This may not be as long as it was when we actually recorded it. But, you know, the thing is, like, this is a really great, I think it was the perfect one of these to do because this podcast is all about film and film history. And, you know, it's it's the, the whole breadth of what film is. And I think this is the perfect one to do because we are talking about films about film, which is so, uh, it's very Ouroboros world. Um, you know, I think it's pretty interesting because, you know, until I started you know, until you brought this up and I was looking, I'm like, there's weirdly not a lot. You would think as much as Hollywood is self-referential, Hollywood seems to be self-referential. There's not a lot of really, there's not a lot of movies specifically about like filmmaking itself. And most of them are maybe not that great. Um, I feel <laughs> like we, there's a lot, a lot there on the periphery, you know, even something like Blazing Saddles. is sort of like there's an element about, Plays yeah. itself, it's about making movies. So there's, there's a meta there's some great, element, uh, or whatever happened to Baby yeah. Jane. They're both actors. Yeah, yep. that's yeah, yeah. But I mean, this maybe down the line it would be one to revisit. But I thought this is a perfect one, first one to do of this sort of series because you know it's yeah, like it's movies about movies, and it's sort of very relevant to what this podcast is about. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm glad that you uh, agreed to take this trip with me. I, I think this was a successful experiment in in our tone. I. I think it's probably going to feel like one of our deep dives, but let me tell you, if we did a deep dive on this particular topic, we would have probably another four or five, six hours to go. Oh uh, yeah, no, it'd be, yes, exactly. So, uh, so I, I think maybe the goal is to not to make a shorter episode, but to make shorter work for us to do behind the scenes. There you I go. Think that's, <laughs> that's how less, I'm going to go forward research. with this. Yeah. Cause we can, some of these we can just jump into a little bit more because I, I was very familiar with the the movies that we that we picked although a, a few of them i had to rewatch again i'm definitely going to go back and watch overnight again because uh sometimes it feels good to be that pissed off <laughs> oh i love it it's it's again i will probably end up i hadn't seen it in forever i actually own it very much like the kids in the picture i own overnight somewhere i there i recently this last year i reorganized all of my horror films, science fiction films, action films, and dramas. The one area I didn't touch was like all my TV and my documentaries. Uh, those are all sort of still unorganized, unalphabetized and sort of, so I was like, well, shit, I'm not going to go. But at least uh, overnight was streaming, was uh, free streaming. I wasn't going to pay four ninety nine to rent a movie I already own. It's just, I, I'm not in that place right now. But, uh, but again, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen the kids save the picture many, many times. But anyways, Devin, this was, uh, I really enjoyed this. Hope, hopefully our listeners enjoyed this. Uh, listeners, if you did enjoy it, let us know on our social media, which uh, I was going to just end this podcast, but I've just realized I don't remember all of the social media it's, <laughs> information. It's just, just search us under Den of Sin podcast. Uh, there you go. We, we continue to not do a whole lot on social media, which is uh, to our detriment, but also uh, social media is a, a creepy playground right now. So for real, yeah. For for multiple with that reasons. with that said though, we are going to be launching our Patreon soon. So if you are a fan of this podcast and would like to support us, uh, please look for that Patreon information soon. It will be eventually posted on our ghost town of social media pages. But hopefully, like if you guys enjoy this, you can help support and help this podcast grow. If not, that's fine too. You can listen to us free on all of our your podcast outlets. Anyways, Devin, I'm going to end that there. This was a, a lot of fun. I really appreciate this. It was a great topic. So thank you for coming up with the topic. And for our listeners, thank you for listening. We appreciate your support. Until next time, hopefully this uh, next episode comes quicker than we've been getting them out to you. It will. It will. We'll make it happen. Always love talking to you, James. Always learn something new. Right back at you, Devin. All right. Take it easy, folks. Bye. <laughs>